All righty. Good morning. This is Friday, July 24th, our last Friday lecture. Any questions before we get started today? All right, then let's talk our game plan. Uh, we need to finish our lecture on spinal cord. Uh, we need to talk about those plexes and then some reflexes. We'll talk about that stuff today. And then depending on how we are on time, uh, we may get a uh, start on our introduction to the autonomic nervous system, which would be nice, but we'll see how the day goes. Our lab today is going to be to cover our cranial nerves. There's that great handout on uh, uh, Canvas. Hopefully you've printed that out. If not, again, you can make your own table. It, you don't have to use that. In fact, there, some of the spaces might be a little small for what you need to write. But we'll talk about the important pieces of information that are on there for you, and we're going to start with that first today. Uh, you still have uh, three assignments due all next week. Uh, Monday, your 15-point nervous review is due, and that is graded for correctness. After yesterday's lecture, you should now have all the information you need to be able to complete that. Uh, so hopefully that will help you to be successful. And again, as I warned you, there is some redundancy in the answers, and that is on purpose. Uh, because as I mentioned, the point of this is to emphasize the relationships uh, between the structural classifications, functional classifications, and the locations of neurons. And so again, there's some redundancy in that, so don't be surprised by that. One more unit review you have to do, unit 14. And then also there's that fun uh, reflexes home lab that uh, those uh, the activities that you're gonna be doing with that. Uh, next week also, we have three exams. On Thursday, you have your lab and lecture exam. Again, you guys know the format for that. You've already taken three of those. Everything is gonna be the same on those. And as always, they must be completed during the class time. You can take them in either order that you want. Um, and then Friday is gonna be your final exam. Again, it is 100 multiple choice questions covering everything we've covered in the class, every section, every chapter, every component that we've talked about. It's going to be on there. Ooh, pardon me. Um, 100 multiple choice questions. Again, the good thing about that is that you don't have to pull the information out of the ether. You just have to recognize the correct information. However, as we've also talked about, you know, multiple choice questions almost by definition are tricky. So make sure you take the time to read them carefully so you can answer them correctly. Uh, 100 of those, uh, you'll have 100 minutes to complete that. And again, that must be completed during the normal class time. Uh, we're supposed to do a two hour, um, you know, finals uh, chunk where you do that within there. But I think that that's silly. I think, uh, again, especially when we're all at home, the flexibility of being able to do it within the class time uh, for the schedule, I think makes more sense. So uh, you will have the entire class time, but again, it must be completed. So uh, if you start at 1230, you're only going to have five minutes to complete it. So make sure you start early enough in the day uh, where you can complete that in the time that is necessary. All right. Questions on any of that? All right, excellent. I'm going to go ahead and clear this so we can talk about our cranial nerves then. For our cranial nerves, if you've looked at the handout, uh, there are really, for all the cranial nerves, there are basically four pieces of information uh, that you are going to be responsible for. Therefore, if you think about it for every single cranial nerve, there's basically four questions that I could ask you. Uh, the first of those, the most obvious of those, is going to be the name and the number of the uh, cranial nerves. Uh, what I will say is that uh, for the number, typically by convention, which again, remember, is just a rule that someone made up, uh, that people tend to use Roman numerals uh, however, if you want to use Arabic, it is fine either way. So if you want to go cranial nerve I, that is fine. If you want to go cranial, oops, cranial nerve one, uh, that is fine. Either way uh, that you want to do that, I am fine with that either of those two ways. So again, I'm not going to make a big deal of saying you have to use Roman numerals. Now that's silly. Uh, we're not going to worry about that. But you do definitely need to know the names of them and the numbers. One of the things that I have provided for you on the handout is a mnemonic to help you with that. Uh, and again, mine is the uh, 
G-rated version of this. There are plenty of PG and even R-rated ones that you can find online, I'm sure, if you like your uh, mnemonics more saucy. Uh, but again, I've provided one of those for you to help you with that. The second piece of information, and maybe let's number these to make sure we're emphasizing this. The second piece of information you are going to be responsible for is the functional type. Oops, I should be saying two there. Uh, by functional type, what I mean by that is uh, essentially the direction uh, the axons carry information. Professor? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I have a quick question. I'm having a little bit of an emergency right now. Um, I'm, my mom is to be rushed to the hospital. Um, the lecture, when is it going to be posted? As soon as I get cop, as soon as it, as soon as I'm able to convert it, I get it put onto YouTube. And so again, usually it's by that evening. But yeah, obviously it'll be posted at some point. Definitely today, if not today, by tomorrow. Uh, go take care of your mom. I hope everything is okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so, again, the functional type is you can think of it in terms of the direction it carries the information, or really the type of information. Uh, one of the things, if you remember, when we talked about our spinal nerves, is we said all of our spinal nerves were mixed, meaning they were made up of a combination of sensory and motor axons. Sensory, of course, carry information in, motor carries information out. However, with our cranial nerves, there are three functional types. Oops, that's not a three. Uh, some of these, really annoying, I'm going to fix this. Uh, some of these functional types, uh, some of the cranial nerves, I should say, are sensory only. Some are motor only. and some are mixed. Now, again, when it comes to mnemonics, notice if we use both uh, motor and mixed, uh, then uh, that doesn't really work from a mnemonic standpoint. So we will use the term both to mean that it's mixed, which means it is both sensory and motor. And again, I've provided a second mnemonic. So this one was mnemonic one. And this one here is mnemonic two. There is a third piece of information. You are going to be responsible for all of these. Not only do you need to know the functional type, and again, the good news is for functional type, there's only three possible answers. But you are also going to be responsible for the specific function, right? That's what the nerve actually does. Right? Uh, again, if we simply work our way through the first cranial nerve, what is the name of the first cranial nerve? Olfactory, excellent. Based on its name of being olfactory, what do you think its functional type is? Do you think it's sensory? Do you think it's motor? Or do you think it's both? Sensory, absolutely. And what do you think it, the specific function of the olfactory nerve is? To smell, absolutely, to provide our sense of smell, exactly. Right, so again, there is a difference between functional type and specific function. Functional type is basically the type of information or the direction we carry information. Obviously, sensory information, as we've talked about, is going to be afferent, motor is going to be efferent, and obviously a mixed nerve would be both afferent and efferent. So the specific function is what the nerve actually does. 
And the fourth piece of information that you are going to be responsible for on the exam is the skull exit. We are still not done with our bones and bone features, right? Obviously, cranial nerves, as the name indicates, are nerves that come off of the brain or brain stem. And so they need to get to whatever location in the body they are. So the skull exit is basically the hole uh, in the skull that the nerve passes through to get to its destination. And let's first finish the first row of our chart. We said the first nerve was olfactory. We said its functional type was sensory. We said its specific function was sense of smell. And anybody remember the bone features, plural, that the olfactory nerve has to pass through to get to the nose so that we can smell? It's olfactory foramina, excellent. So just that easily, we have figured out and filled in the first line of our chart. And we'll go through it again, but I want to make sure we understand the four pieces of information you are responsible for. Now, if you look, there is a fifth column on your handout. That fifth column is something that I've referred to as brain exit. By brain exit, and the reason I have this here is this is a location where you can write a definition or description of where the nerve exits the brain or brainstem. This isn't a question I'm going to ask you on the exam, right? This is for you to find the nerve. So there is no right answer on this for how you would go about filling this part of it out. This is just for you to write something so that you can say where a nerve might particularly be located. Sometimes the brain exit might be obvious. Other times it's just gonna be more vague in its description, right? If we cheat and go to our cranial nerve picture. Oops, hold on. There, I want that, share that, there you go. Right, so again, some of these might be more obvious. For instance, the olfactory nerve comes off the olfactory bulb. That is an actual structure, right? But this one here, you can say it comes off the side of the ponds, or this one comes up below the ponds and is medial, whereas this one is below the ponds and is lateral. Again, if you wanted, you could use the cephalons, right? This one comes off the telencephalon, this one comes off the diencephalon, this one comes off the mesencephalon, and so on and so forth. Or you can just give a description of where they are, right? This one is in front of the pituitary gland, this one is below the pituitary gland or between the pituitary gland and the mammillary bodies and the pons, whatever. Again, it's not a question I'm gonna ask you on the exam. The point of this column is so that when I point add a nerve on the exam and ask you one of those four questions, you can figure out which of the nerves it is. Because on the exam, I'm gonna have a picture just like this, or a picture just like a model, and I don't like the white, so let's go ahead and make it black instead. I could have an arrow pointing to a nerve just like this on the exam, and I'm gonna ask you one of four questions. Identify the nerve by name and number. Identify the functional type of the nerve identify the specific function of the nerve, identify the skull exit of the nerve. One of those four questions based on that right there. So again, the mnemonic rows are for your mnemonics, so let's go back to those. Let's go back to the handout. So for our first mnemonic, it's uh, once one takes the O, o once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations are heavenly. 
So basically what that does is that the first, like most mnemonics, the first letter of those uh, tells you the first letter of whatever the nerve is. So again, as we mentioned, uh, cranial nerve one is olfactory. It starts with an O. Cranial nerve two is, right? What's cranial nerve two? Anyone know? Optic, there you go, exactly. So again, this is the mnemonic I've provided you. Like I said, it is the G version, the Disney version of this. Oops, I forgot. There we go. Uh, of those, but like I said, that's, I'll be honest, that's not the one that I learned when I was in graduate school. Uh, mine is more of an NC-17 version of it, so I won't bother sharing that one with you, but I'm sure a quick web search would find you any that you wanted that way. Uh, same thing for the functional type. The second mnemonic location is the functional type. Again, there's three possible answers. So I've given you a very simple basic mnemonic, and it is some say, uh, marry money, but my brother, oops, brother says big brains matter most. All right, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Perfect. So even without knowing anything else about it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, what do you think the functional type of cranial nerve eight is? These are the easy. Starts with an S. How about there's three possible answers. So it's sensory, excellent. What do you think uh, the functional type of cranial nerve six is? Now, nope. remember M stands for motor. And then cranial nerve 10, both. That's the one that it's mixed. So again, so I've given you two spaces for the two mnemonics to help you to remember what the name and number is, to help you to know what your functional type is. And again, that's gonna be key. On the lab exam, again, it's all about it's all about understanding this information, remembering this information. So there's two things that I would remind you to do. Uh, the first is that if I ask you the functional type on the lab exam, how many possible answers are there? Three. So if you write anything other than sensory, motor, or both, I guess you could write mixed, but if you write anything other than those three answers, you know it's going to be wrong. Because if I ask for a functional type, there's only three possible answers. Okay? So again, these mnemonics help you. Um, again, they're great ways to remember these things. When it comes to the exam, uh, if you want, remember you have that whiteboard. So when you first start the exam, if you want to bring up that whiteboard and write your mnemonics on that so that you have them easily and readily available for you. Remember, you cannot have scratch paper or anything like that around you. But a quick mind dump onto your whiteboard of your mnemonics is a great, way, a great way to start your lab exam so that you have that information to help you to be successful. All right, or if just write it in the answer for question one and then you can go back and erase it at the end of that or something like that. But the nice thing about the whiteboard is you have it there available. So again, I would encourage you to take advantage of these, uh, but you're not required to. And again, I'm not gonna ask you the mnemonics on the exam. These mnemonics are to help you to know the information you need to know. So on the exam, there are four pieces of information that I can ask you. So again, if you think about it, there's 12 nerves. There's four pieces of information for each nerve. So how many is that? Four times 12, 48 Four pieces of information. Yeah, exactly. It's really 52, but uh, uh, we'll figure that out later. All right, excellent. So the point is you have this, and remember, as I mentioned, uh, based on the speed of which we're getting through this information, uh, it is going to be about 25% of your exam, your lab exam. And anything that important, do you think it's likely to find its way onto the lecture exam as well? Yeah, probably. All right.
any questions on the process or what it is that I'm looking for on this? Again, you're not turning this handout in. This is a study guide for you. So what you need is something that has four columns, six if you want to write the mnemonics down to help you, and seven if you want to have that brain exit to help you to describe where to find the nerve. But those, like I said, the key is there's going to be four questions I will ask you on each possible. And each nerve will have at least four questions that I can ask you on. All right. Any questions on that? All right, excellent then. Then let's go to the pretty picture. Here is our pretty picture. And it is of the brain and brain stem. And on it, we can see our cranial nerves. Now, in, when counting the cranial nerves, uh, the good news is you start anteriorly and work posteriorly. And usually in most instances, you are going to go when they're at similar levels, you go from medial to lateral. So cranial nerve one comes off of this right here, two, three, and four. Notice three and four are medial and lateral above the pons. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And then right here in the middle is 12. Remember, we saw these for uh, last class yesterday. We noticed that the olive is between 9, 10, 11, and 12. And the pyramids are between the two 12s. Again, remember, these are all paired nerves. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we have the pretty picture that shows this. Here we can actually see this on an actual brain as well. These nerves and these structures coming off of here that way. And your book's got some great resources to help you to look at this. It's got a nice uh, table that talks about the nerves, tells you whether as a sensory or a motor function. So notice this one's sensory. Notice this one's motor. Notice this one's both. So again, it shows us our functional types that are here when we look at this chart for that. All right, so we have already done this one, but let's go through it again because we really haven't had uh, the best view of it. This is definitely the best view that we have seen of our olfactory nerve. Here again is our friend, the olfactory bulb. As we know, the olfactory bulb connects with the olfactory tract to go back to the limbic system, right, where we get all that strong emotion, all that strong memory associated with our sense of smell. The nerves, and the, the cranial nerve one is unique in that typically we think of a nerve as a single bundle of axons. Notice in this case, our axons aren't really bundled into a single structure. What this always reminds me of is a hairbrush, right? Obviously, clearly, I've had a lot of experience with hairbrushes, so I know them very, very well, and I know they have a handle. That handle would be the olfactory tract. They have a head that is the olfactory bulb, and then they have all the bristles that come off of it. If this was a hairbrush, then these bristles that come off of it would be the individual axons that collectively make the olfactory nerve. So the olfactory nerve is a bundle of axons. It's just axons that aren't bundled together. It makes it somewhat unique that way. As we see, it uh, moves through the olfactory foramina. And that was a bone feature of what bone again? What bone are the olfactory foramina a bone feature of? The ethmoid bone, excellent. So our skull exit is the olfactory foramina of the ethmoid bone. And all these axons come down into the superior part of the nasal cavity where they have chemoreceptors. So as you inhale uh, particles that are dissolved in moisture, they attach to these nerves, that chemical, like a key in a lock, which is a lock, and we perceive that sense of smell. All right, questions on that one? I think hopefully that's pretty straightforward. 
All right, stun silence means I've totally mastered this. Excellent, let's move on to our second one. Cranial nerve two. We've actually talked about the anatomy of cranial nerve two already as well. Cranial nerve two, of course, is the optic nerve. The optic nerve uh, is functional type is, of course, what? What is the functional type of the optic nerve? Sensory, excellent. And what specific function does it have? Excellent, to be able to see, spectacular, excellent. Remember, as we talked about, the optic nerves come together and fuse to form a single structure called the optic chiasm, where we get a partial crossing of information so that all the information from the right-hand side of the world goes to the left side of the brain, all the information from the left side of the world goes to the right side of the brain. And so at that chiasm, we then go to the optic tracts. From the optic tracts, we go, oh, look, to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, we snuck in a fourth one, to the thalamus, which is the relay station, to our occipital lobe, where our visual cortex is. All right. So we know the nerve, we know its name, we know its functional type, we know its specific function. And the other thing, of course, we know is that it has its very own VIP exit out of the skull to get to the orbit of the eye. And what did we call that very special VIP skull exit of the optic nerve? Here, maybe something like this would help. So we have this opening here that goes through that way, this one here that goes through that way, which is where they cross. Remember we talked about they cross right over the pituitary gland, which should be seen there. What is that opening? Or maybe if you have trouble remembering it this way, although I could certainly show you this picture on the exam point here and ask you this, what cranial nerve goes through this skull exit, but maybe I'll make it even easier. All right, oh, yeah, let's make it red. There it is, the VIP exit uh, for the optic nerve to get to the orbit of the eye. What is the skull exit of the optic nerve? Optic foramen, excellent. Or remember what we also called the optic canal. Excellent. All right. There you go, two, just as easy as one. Questions on that? Do we need to know the bone also, or just the exit? Should you know the bone? What is the bone? Mm. There you go, you were, you were slurping it. Sphenoid, absolutely. Um, Technically, you should know the bone for these with the, if they are bone features, but at this point, if you just give me the bone feature, since we're this late in the class, I will assume you know the bone. Okay. But it certainly wouldn't hurt to put the bone as well. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All righty. Excellent. So I think one and two, very simple, very straightforward. All right. Everybody get how the game is played? because now we're gonna mix things up a little bit. If you remember, and I need to go back to our whiteboard first. All right, I need that down there out of my way and this up here out of my way so I can do some playing. If you remember, one of the things that I mentioned when we were doing the skeletal system is that we talked about the only pure muscles in the body, the only muscles that we have in the body uh, that our pure one type of skeletal muscle are the ones that are associated with the eyeball. So here's my eyeball. And just for reference, um, there's the nose. And we'll draw an ear out here. That's a little off screen. There's my ear. And let's give it a squiggly pin. There you go, excellent. So there's my eyeball. As I mentioned, there are six muscles 
that move our eyeball through space. And they're all made of fast glycolytic fibers. They're the only pure muscles. We didn't, I didn't make you learn them at the time because I told you it was going to take you about 30 seconds to learn them. One of them is a straight muscle that is located above the eye. Didn't we have a name for muscles that were straight? We had a straight muscle in our leg. We had a straight muscle in our belly region. What did we call those straight muscles? What was the term we used for a straight muscle? Clue, parallel is the type, but in the abdominal region, I had a, a straight muscle. In the femoral region, I had a straight muscle, a rectus. And this rectus happens to be above the eye. If it's above the eye, how do we describe things that are above? Supra, or even more than that, superior. So the straight muscle above the eyeball, that if you think about it would pull the eye up, is the superior rectus. And guess what? we have a straight muscle below the eye. Guess what we call that? Inferior rectus. Guess what? We have a straight muscle on the ear hole side of the eyeball. What do you think we call that? Lateral. There you go. Rectus. Lateral rectus. Candid, is that you? Yeah, that's me. Is your mom okay? She went to the hospital. Uh, oh. They took her to uh, Kaiser, so I'll see her after the class. Okay. All right. Well, I, I, I hope everything's okay. And again, like I said, if you need to go, remember this is being recorded. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, lateral rectus. Excellent. And then we also have a straight muscle on the nose hole side of the eyeball. And guess what we call that one? Medial rectus, excellent. There you go, 20 seconds and you've learned four muscles just that quickly. However, actually I'm gonna cheat and put that one there. And put that one there since I'm in my way. There are two more muscles. One of those muscles is a muscle at an angle and this one muscle at an angle underneath the eye is at an angle underneath the eye what do we call angled muscles like in the abdominal region they have two angled muscles in the abdominal region Obliques, excellent. And this one is under the eye, so guess how we identify it? There you go. Inferior oblique. And not terribly surprisingly, we have an angled muscle above the eye as well. the superior oblique. Excellent. And as promised in 30 seconds, you have learned six new muscles. Now, notice I did draw something wonky about our uh, superior oblique, and I will show you the picture of this in just a second, but let's do this first. What happens with our superior oblique is there is a bit of connective tissue uh, that connects to the orbit of the eye. And this connective tissue changes the angle of the tendon, uh, tendon pardon me, changes the angle of the muscle, uh, kind of like a pulley. And if you remember, like when we were looking at the humerus, our humerus has 
a bone feature that kind of looks like a pulley. Does anybody remember what we called it? What is the bone feature of the humerus that looks like a, a pulley? No one remember? Kind of bow tie shaped. It's where it connects to the ulna. It connects to the trochlear notch of the ulna. What bone feature of the humerus connects to the trochlear notch of the ulna? What? There we go. Finally, excellent. Thank God Ariel's here today. Trochlea. The trochlea is the term for a pulley. And this one has a little bit of a pulley, a little bit of a trochlea to it as well. All right. Now, again, I've done an amazing job of drawing this, but let's quickly take a look at the picture and then we're going to come back to this drawing. So notice there's the trochlea for the superior oblique changing its angle. Here's the inferior oblique, the lateral rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus. And over there on the other side, we see the medial rectus. So here they show it from the side because they want to emphasize the nerves, but I want to look at it from the front. So again, now that we've done that, we'll come back to this picture again, uh, but I want to start here. The reason we're taking the time to do this is here we are going to learn about cranial nerves three. Oops, hold on, I don't want this to be red. Let's make these black for starters. Cranial nerves three, cranial nerve four, and cranial nerve six. Let's actually start with six. Let's start with cranial nerve six. What is the name of cranial nerve six? Abducens, excellent. Can you guys are allowed to have your books and other resources out while we're doing this? Abducens. What does ab, abducens sound an awful lot like? Abduct, exactly. Now, what is the functional type of cranial nerve six again? Motor, excellent. So if its functional type is motor and it sounds like abduct, then what do you think the specific function of cranial nerve six might be? Well, how about to abduct the eye? And which of our six muscles here do you think would allow us to abduct the eye? Well, abducting the eye means to take the eye, and if you look here at my right eye, and move it away from the midline, which of these muscles would move my eye away from the midline or move it towards my ear hole? Lateral rectus, there you go. So if you think about the specific function, you could say that it abducts the eye, or you could say that it controls the lateral rectus. Both would be good ways to describe the function of cranial nerve six. So this lateral rectus is controlled by cranial nerve six. Whoops, I keep doing that. Now, Cranial nerve six, abducting the eyes. Can you abduct both eyes at the same time? Can you admit, stare at the screen right now and make both eyes move out to the side? Anybody able to do that? Is it possible? Can you do it, Madison? If anybody can do it, I want to see it on camera. 
<laughs> we can do one at a time, right? Like I can move both eyes and there I abducted this one, or I can do both eyes and abducted that one, but I can't abduct both at the same time. Is there an opportunity? Are there a lot of opportunities where you would want to? Uh, maybe there are some people who are able to do that, but there are very few. Yeah, I mean, again, the same way we, some people can wiggle their ears, the same way Terry Crews can control the individual muscles. I guess technically it is possible but there aren't very many people who are actually capable of doing it. So not surprisingly, this nerve, cranial nerve six, doesn't get a tremendous amount of work. And in fact, it is actually our smallest cranial nerve. Cranial nerve six is our smallest cranial nerve. Because it's the, and I don't want to say least important function, but probably the least used function of all of these nerves. So it is one of the smaller, smallest cranial nerves with some of the least important functionality to it. All right, let's then, oh, we need one more piece of information for this. What is its skull exit? How do you think? Uh, and let's for this cheat and go back to the picture. We know that cranial nerve six needs to get into the orbit of the eye here. But we also know that he is not going to be allowed in that VIP entrance. That VIP entrance is the VIP entrance for one thing and one thing only. Optic nerve is the only thing that goes through the optic canal. If only there was some other type of opening that a mere mortal nerve, a little peon nerve, could use to get into the orbit of the eye. Does such a bone feature exist? What did I just put a circle around? There you go, exactly, excellent. Perfect. So absolutely, the skull exit of our abducens, cranial nerve six, is going to be the superior orbital fissure. Excellent. And that is cranial nerve six. All right. Excellent. Let's do another one. Just out of curiosity, what is cranial nerve four's name? Trochlear. Excellent, it is the trochlear nerve. Well, that sounds vaguely familiar. Doesn't something else in here have a trochlea associated with it? Yeah, about that superior oblique. Now, remind me again, what is the functional type of cranial nerve for? Motor, excellent. So what do you think the specific function of the trochlear nerve is? Well, how about to control the muscle that goes through the trochlea? All right, it's gonna control the superior oblique. If you contracted the superior oblique, any idea what that might do to the eye? Not a bad guess, but if you think about it, uh, again, if you, you might think that it would go up because the superior rectus is gonna bring it up. But actually because of the pulley, the way the pulley comes on it, what it actually does to the eyes is it rotates the eyes down and in. Like when you are staring at your phone all day long or when you're reading a book all day long or you're staring at your notes all day long, right? Back in ancient time, there were things called books and people enjoyed reading books. 
and they would look down and in at the books all the time. And if you spend four hours reading a book, one of the things that happens is you start to get this pain kind of like up here in your eye. That pain that you feel up here in that orbit of the eye is the fatigue of that superior oblique. Right? Remember, these are fast glycolytic fibers. They fatigue easily. So if you're constantly looking down and in at a book or at a phone or things like that, you put this strain on your superior oblique and it can become fatigued and it can actually become painful. It's why whether you're on the computer, whether you're on your phone, whether you're on a book, you're supposed to look up and, and off in the distance for a while so that you're not stressing your eye with the focus and that you're not stressing your superior oblique as well. So it turns eye down and in. Excellent. We also need a skull exit. What might a good skull exit for the trochlear nerve be? Do we need to go back to the picture or do you think we can figure it out? Exactly, it also is going to use the superior orbital fissure, right? Superior orbital fissure is the main door for getting into the bar that is the optic uh, uh, cavity. Right, the ocular cavity, whereas the optic canal is the VIP entrance for the optic nerve. Excellent. So again, our superior oblique controlled by cranial nerve four. We whip those two out really easily as well. And that leaves us with one more. What color haven't I used? I've got green, I've got blue, uh, I guess purple. Oh, whoops, hold on. Make that blue again. Four. And that brings us to cranial nerve three. What is the name of cranial nerve three? Excellent. Oculomotor. With a name like oculomotor, what do you think its functional type is going to be? Motor, there you go, excellent, perfect. So, when it comes to the specific function then, with a name like ocular motor, it is gonna be involved in controlling motor activity of the eye, right? Yes, it does not control the lateral rectus. Yes, it does not control the superior oblique, but we have four other muscles in here. So this controls the four other muscles of the eye. And of course, those are the superior rectus, and I'm just gonna abbreviate this right here, the inferior rectus, uh, the medial rectus, and the inferior oblique. But I'm trying to remember, I'm not sure if anybody got it correct. There was a couple of you who got one of the, um, one of the questions on the uh, lecture exam to identify a location where you would find smooth muscle in the head. Right? And one of the places where you find smooth muscle in the head is inside of your eyeball. Right? Smooth muscle in there does two things for us. One of the things it allows you to do is change the focus of your eyes. Right? You can look down at the screen if you're real close to it, but you can also look across the room and make something out there. That ability to change your focus is because you have a little rubber ball inside of your eyes, which is a flexible lens. And that flexible lens allows you to bend light at different angles so that you can read things up close and you can read things far away. That is until you get a little bit older. As you get a little bit older, that rubber ball gets a little more inflexible. And now when you're trying to read without your old man glasses, you get to play the trombone as you're trying to get that into focus, or you can finally give in and get some readers so that you're able to 
uh, be able to read things up close. The other bit of smooth muscle in your eye allows you to change the diameter to how much light you let in. Again, back in ancient times, there were places called movie theaters where you would get to go and sit in the dark with a bunch of other people and watch entertainment on a big screen. Of course, one of the advantages of there is when you go there, you can buy a six ounce Coke for $4.75. Or for a nickel more, you can get a 55 gallon drum of soda. So of course, for a nickel more, you get your 55 gallon of soda, which means of course, halfway through the movie, you have to get up and go pee. You have no problem getting out of your seat, getting out to the bathroom and coming to the bathroom. But when you come back, how easy is it to get back to your seat? It's not as easy because one of the things that's happened is that while you've been in the dark, your pupil is dilated to let more at light in so you could see better. When you go outside into the, into the concession area, right, or the bathroom, there's bright light there so it constricts again. And then when you go back into the dark, not as much light gets in and it's harder to see, right? Or, uh, so questions on that. So. Inside the eye, we have smooth muscle. And that smooth muscle is involved in the lens and the iris. The lens is what changes the focus. The uh, iris is what changes how much light gets in. And our ocular motor nerve controls that too. So notice it controls most of the skeletal and all the smooth muscle of the eye. And with a name like ocular motor, that shouldn't be too terribly surprising. All right. Questions on that? All right. We have done the pretty picture of this, but let's actually look at the illustration from your textbook and take a better view of these things. Now that we have a better sense of what we are looking at, we can kind of make some sense of this image. Notice, and I'll just use the highlighter for now. Here is our lateral rectus that has been cut, and notice there is this nerve here, that abducens nerve, cranial nerve six, that connects to it. Remember I said cranial nerve six is the smallest cranial nerve. It's also slightly displaced. Notice three and four come off above the pons, whereas the abducens is below the pons. So it's not only is it small and sad and lonely, right, with its little job. Notice up here, uh, let's change colors. We have cranial nerve four. Cranial nerve four, notice, innervates the superior oblique muscle. But notice something else about it. It is above the pons. It appears, and when we look at the illustration, I'll show you this more clearly. It appears, and let me actually write this. It appears above the pons and lateral. But if you look closely at this illustration, and I have another picture that'll show it really nicely as well, it actually comes off the posterior side of the brainstem. In fact, cranial nerve four is the only posterior cranial nerve. It actually actually comes out beneath our superior colliculus, or pardon me, inferior colliculus. Again, if we'll, we'll take a pretty picture where we'll see this in just a minute, but we'll look at it here in this view first. So six is the smallest, four is special in that it is the only one that is posterior. Three, on the other hand, here we see it coming off here. And as we mentioned, it controls most of the motor, uh, most of the muscles. So notice it is going to uh, the superior uh, rectus. It is going to the inferior rectus. It is going to the inferior oblique. It is going to the medial rectus. And notice right here is a ganglion 
that it is using to innervate the smooth muscle inside of the eyeball as well. So here we see this pretty picture, not a, a, you know, not as simplistic as the one I've drawn, but it does still show, do a really nice job of showing you what is innervated by the nerves here. Here we see them each individually. Here is cranial nerve four. Notice it comes off the posterior of the brain stem underneath the capora quadrumina, underneath the superior and the inferior colliculus. Through the superior orbital fissure to the superior oblique to turn the eye down and in. Here underneath the pons, our smallest cranial nerve, the abducens nerve, comes off, comes through the superior orbital fissure and innervates the lateral rectus. Oh, you're right, I don't think we did say what the uh, skull exit of cranial nerve three is, but what do you, if four goes through the superior orbital fissure and six goes through the superior orbital fissure, guess what three goes through? The superior orbital fissure. And so here we see three coming off immediately above the pons through the superior orbital fissure, but thank you for catching that. I, I apologize for not saying that uh, when we did that. Through the superior orbital fissure, two, right, the inferior rectus, superior rectus, uh, the medial rectus, the inferior oblique, and the smooth muscle of the eye. All right, lastly, as I mentioned, we wanna be able to identify them. As I mentioned, six, Four six, smallest, displaced, sad, and lonely six. Six is medial below the pons. Notice so are seven and eight, but are six, seven, and eight equally separated, equally spaced underneath the pons? No, seven and eight hang out together. Seven and eight are BFFs. So poor lonely little six is way down here below the pons all by itself. Whereas way up here, Medially, we have cranial nerve three, and laterally, we have cranial nerve six, uh, pardon me, cranial nerve four. But notice also, four looks lateral, but if we flip the view and look from the posterior side, notice here is our capora quadrumina, the two superior colliculi and the two inferior colliculi and then beneath that coming out underneath the inferior, inferior colliculus is that cranial nerve four. So four is the only nerve that is posterior. So six is the smallest, four is posterior. And we'll cut, run across a couple other special nerves as we work our way around as well. All right, questions on that? All right, um, clear that. And then of course, as we mentioned, for all of these, cranial nerve three, cranial nerve four, and cranial nerve six, all of them use the superior orbital fissure as their skull exit. They all go through the same skull exit to get to the orbit of the eye. All right, so. Here's the good news, we are almost halfway. We only have one left and we've reached the top of the mountain, halfway point of this uh, cranial nerve discussion. Here's the bad news. That one nerve that is left is the trigeminal nerve. All right, and trigeminal, tri refers to what? Three. What's special about the trigeminal nerve is the trigeminal nerve has three branches. And here's the problem with that. All right, let me make sure I save this image so I can erase it. Because when we talk about the trigeminal nerve, the trigeminal nerve, there's no reason for this to be purple. is the largest cranial nerve. In fact, it is so large that it has three main branches. 
that come off of it. And we are going to need to know the name of each branch, the specific function of each branch, and the skull exit. of each branch. Oh, and just for the heck of it, name of each branch, functional type, of each branch, specific function of each branch, and skull exit of each branch. If we look at the anatomy of this, and I'll draw this kind of simplistically. The trigeminal nerve, like I said, is the largest branch. It's the only one that comes off of the pons. It's lateral oops, on the pons. And then it comes almost immediately to a large ganglion. And that large ganglion then has three branches that come off of it. Branch one. Branch two and branch three. I think that should give me enough room to write what I need to write. Excellent. The superiormost branch is what is known as the ophthalmic branch. Let's make that a little larger. We have our ophthalmic branch. The second branch is known as the mandibular, uh, pardon me, maxillary branch. And the third branch is the mandibular. Excellent. Now, with the ophthalmic branch, where does it sound like it's going? With a name like ophthalmic, where do you think it goes? All right, when you go to an ophthalmologist. Well, when you go to an ophthalmologist, what does an ophthalmologist look at for you? Not a bad guess. Ophthalmologist is the medical surgeon who does eyeball stuff. This goes to the orbit of the eye. Right? Now, if you think about it going towards the orbit of the eye, could there be any muscle function left for this ophthalmic nerve to do? We just saw three nerves going to every single possible muscle in that eye. And it's certainly not providing sensory, I mean, uh, visual information, because we know the optic nerve does that. So what our ophthalmic branch is, is sensory only. And that is sensory only of a feel of sensation from the eye, the nose, the scalp, the forehead. Right? It doesn't move the eyeball. It doesn't give you your vision. But if someone pokes you in the eye, are you aware of that? Right? Or some uh, bug lands on your nose. Right? You have an itch on your scalp or your forehead. Yeah, you're aware of all of those things. And that is what this ophthalmic branch provides. It provides sensory sensation, basically, of all of this, of the eyeball up. Sensory sensation of all of this here. Now, of course, if it's going to get to the orbit of the eye, not surprisingly, we actually have a nice big hole 
that several other nerves are already passing through for a skull exit. So what might a big good skull exit to get towards this portion of the eye be for our ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve? Excellent. So notice not one, not two, not three, but four different nerves all go through that superior orbital fissure into the orbit of the eye. Excellent. All right. With a name like maxillary branch, where do you think the maxillary branch of our trigeminal nerve goes? To the maxilla. Goes to the maxillary bone. Can someone jump on camera and move their maxilla for me? Just wiggle your maxilla. Rotate it 45 degrees. Can anybody move their maxilla? No, exactly. So do you think your maxillary branch is gonna be sensory? Do you think it's gonna be motor? Or do you think it's gonna be both? Sensory. Excellent. It is going to be sensory only. Spectacular. All right. And being sensory only, it is going to basically provide you with tactile sensation from uh, the nasal cavity, uh, the palate of the the palate of the mouth, uh, palate. Uh, I'm going to check my list. Uh, upper teeth. Uh, and cheek and upper lip. So basically your maxillary branch gives you information from basically this part, sensory sensation from this part of your face. Now here's where things get a little bit trickier. If you remember, As we looked inside of the skull, here was that superior orbital fissure again. So let's go ahead and highlight that. There's our superior orbital fissure that we can see here. Oops, I did do that, undo that a little bit. So what we need for our second branch is a nice opening that is close to this, because obviously they need to be close to each other but doesn't project inferiorly and instead projects anteriorly. Might such a thing be present here? Do we happen to notice an opening right here projecting anteriorly? There you go, exactly. The skull exit of our uh, maxillary branch is the foramen rotundum. Excellent. Now, as I mentioned, the trigeminal is our largest nerve. And being the largest nerve, what is the functional type of the trigeminal nerve? Both, excellent. It is indeed both. But notice the ophthalmic branch was only sensory. The maxillary branch was only sensory. So when we get down here to the mandibular branch, the ophthalmic branch, with name like mandi pardon me, with the mandibular branch, where do you think the mandibular branch goes? Goes to the mandible. Now, the ophthalmic branch gave us sensory. The maxillary branch gave us sensory. Do you think we're gonna get sensory from the mandibular branch? Absolutely. But as we've also talked about, what's so special about your mandible compared to all the other bones of your skull? It moves, exactly. So it is the mandibular branch that gives us sensory and motor for its functional type and that 
this mandibular branch is what makes the whole trigeminal nerve a mixed branch, a mixed nerve, because the mandibular branch has sensory and motor. From a sensory standpoint, its function is going to be a tactile sensation from the a lower lip, a lower teeth, a jaw. Uh, is that everything? Yeah, oh, and tongue. Some tactile from the tongue. Not taste, we'll talk about taste in a minute, but some tactile from the tongue. Excellent. And, oh yeah, uh, uh, Adina. Oh, I'm sorry. Over a period of time as babies grow, do cranial nerves move and shift their exit or does it exit the same way out always regardless of age? Uh, yes, it always stays the same and goes to the same location. I do apologize for not catching that question. Thank you guys for, for making me aware of that. I do apologize. Um, so yes, it does. Uh, no, that once once they get to their destination, uh, they um, they don't move in those relationships. Again, we do know that there are some changes that take place in the skull, but more that is more the forming of the sutures and the things along those lines. It wouldn't necessarily affect something that was going through the superior uh, orbital fissure or through the uh, foramen rotundum or something like that. So thank you. I apologize for not catching that sooner. All right. So that is our sensory function. Our motor function, as you guys have already talked about, is to move the jaw, right? It's going to be to elevate and retract the jaw, mastication. And in particular, uh, it controls some of the muscles that we talked about, like the temporalis and the masseter. So those are all controlled by this as well. So the last thing we need is a skull exit. Is there a skull exit that is close to the frame and rotundum that projects inferiorly? That would be a good exit. Maybe it helps if we go back to the picture. All right, so again, we've got these three branches that sit together. Branch one goes out this pure orbital fissure, branch two, and there you go, branch three. Exactly, the foramen ovale is the skull exit of the mandibular branch. Perfect. So there you go. For our trigeminal nerve, there are three distinct branches. You need to know the names of all three branches. You need to know the specific function of each of the three branches. You need to know the skull exit of each of the three branches. Questions on that? All right, we've done that here, but like I said, your book really does a great job of uh, showing the cranial nerve. So I jumped ahead here, but here we see again, here's that trigeminal nerve. Again, notice it's the only one that comes off of the pons here on the uh, lateral aspect of the pons. Here we see that nice uh, ganglion that we talked about, and then three branches. The ophthalmic branch that is going to go over here to the eyeball, to the nose, to the forehead and scalp, here we see the maxillary branch going to the nasal cavity, to the palate, to the roof of the mouth, the teeth. Right? This is that nerve that actually sits in our maxillary sinus. I don't know if you remember when we were talking about the maxillary sinus, one of the things that we said is if you have, oh, I, we shouldn't be yellow for that. Um, if you have like a root canal and an infection gets in there, we talked about how painful that maxillary sinus infection can be. And that's because the swelling in this space pushes on this maxillary branch of our uh, trigeminal nerve and can be incredibly painful. And notice it, the ophthalmic branch went through the superior orbital fissure to get there. Maxillary branch went through the frame and rotundum. And our mandibular branch goes through the foramen ovale, 
to get to tactile of the tongue uh, and to tactile of the teeth and the jaw, but also, as we talked about, controlling motor movement of it as well, like the masseter, like the temporalis. And again, notice we have these three branches going to these three locations, up towards the eye, up towards the upper jaw, up towards the lower jaw. So there's our sensory function and there's our motor function. And it was a little bit more steep to get to the apex than we thought, but we have now hit the halfway point, talked about all the information of the first six cranial nerves. All right, questions on that? All right, we've made it to the apex. This is a good place to take our first break. Uh, let's go ahead and take our first break then. We'll take a 15 minute break. Uh, so that means coming back at 941. And I will start the recording at that time. All righty, questions on any of that? All right, excellent. I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. So, like I said, we've made it to the top of the mountain. Now it is the time to work our way back down. We've hit our first six cranial nerves. Time to hit uh, the last six. Starting first with seven. What is the name of seven? Facial. Excellent. And what is its functional type? Sensory, motor, or both? Both. Perfect. Excellent. So again, when we talk about a specific function, then we need to talk about both a sensory one and a motor one. With a name like facial, the motor one might be a little bit easier to understand. As you can see here clearly from the illustration, it controls most of the facial muscles. One of the things that we talked about is how expressive our faces can be. We talked about how good we are reading those expressions and being able to express our emotions with our facial uh, expressions. And so that ability to emote with our face is the major function of the uh, facial nerve. If you remember way back in the cheat and jump ahead for a second to our skull exit, Notice the skull exit for this is the tiny hole that's over here between the mastoid process of the temporal bone and the styloid process of the temporal bone. Anyone remember what the name of that particular hole was in between the styloid process and the mastoid process? Yeah, if you're unsure, it says it right there, you can read it, absolutely. Right, absolutely, it is the stylo mastoid foramen. If you guys remember, one of the things we talked about when we were learning the temporal bone and talked about the stylomastoid foramen is it is a very tiny hole. So if you remember at the time when we were talking about it, one of the things that we said is that, remember, the mastoid uh, process has a big sinus inside of it. And if that sinus becomes infected, it can squeeze the opening. And as it squeezes the opening, it basically constricts the facial nerve and it stops activity from going out the facial nerve to your face and suddenly you can't move one half of your face. And what did we call that condition again? Does anybody remember what we called that condition? Bell's palsy, excellent. Perfect. So there you go. So that condition of Bell's palsy that we talked about way back in the day, now we talked about the hole, now we get to talk about the nerve that passes through it and allows for that. But as we mentioned, there is also a sensory function of it as well. And the sensory function of the facial nerve is uh, involving our tongue again. Only in this case, it is taste on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. I believe I have a pretty picture of the tongue here. 
Let's see if we can look at that. Uh, oh, I guess I don't. Thought I did. All right, I lied. All right, well, that doesn't fit there nicely. So let's go back to this for a second. So again, facial nerve, cranial nerve seven. Its functional type is both. It's a mixed nerve. It's taste on the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Control of the facial muscles. So, and skull exit is the stylomastoid foramen. So let's go ahead and erase that so we can look at this pretty picture and get a oh, better. Oh, quick question. Yes. Um, I'm just curious. I don't know if you ever saw the show on Netflix called Lie to Me. Uh, it's pretty much uh, experts that are um, like, uh, I mean, they're experts in facial expressions, like kind of like a lie detector test, you know? Yeah. When people does, uh, when they speak, they can tell by their facial expressions if they're lying or not. Sure. Uh, and, and things like that, posture and other stuff as well. Is that actually true? Do you know? Um, yes and no. Uh, can people's mannerisms tell you something about their emotions and their behaviors? Absolutely. We talked about that with the limbic system. And again, uh, it is, I, I'm not familiar with the TV show, uh, but uh, there are plenty of examples of that. For instance, one of the things uh, where you see this also is, especially in gamblers, poker, right? P uh, poker's become much more, um, much more um, popular uh, in mainstream, and so you see it on TV and stuff all the time. And some of the things that those poker players do is they'll wear the, uh, you know, they'll wear uh, sunglasses, so that people can't see their eyes or their eye movements. Or the other thing you'll see is there will hoods or they will wear high collared shirts. The reason they do that is one of the things that, gets hap that happens when you get excited. Like if you're making a big bluff or you get cards and they're really, really good cards and you get excited, remember as we talked about, our limbic system converts our conscious thought into subconscious actions. And so one of the things that happens is when you get excited, your heart starts beating faster. And what actually you can see is you can actually see their carotid artery starting to palpate, starting to uh, pulse as a result of that. And that can be an indication that someone lied when they made a big bet or they got a really good set of hands or stuff like that. So being able to read people's expressions or read people's behaviors and read people's manner mannerisms is absolutely a skill that many people work at. Now, where uh, you be careful on, on those shows, and again, I don't not familiar with the show, but one of the things that often when they they tend to do on these types of things is they tend to generalize them. Well, for instance, they'll say, you know, that if someone looks up into the left, that means they're lying, right? Not everybody looks up into the left when they're lying, uh, but people do tend to have general mannerisms that they may do when they're lying. And so, the more you observe somebody, the better you're going to be at being able to read those. Yep. Got it. All right, so like I said, it controls the face. There are some autonomic controls that we'll talk about later when we get to the autonomic nervous system next week. But the other big thing that we wanna talk about is the sense of taste. Taste occurs on the tongue. Oops, not sure why that did that. Uh, is, uh, and primarily taste on the anterior two thirds of the tongue. I thought I had a picture of the tongue here. So I don't seem to have a picture on this. Let me stop sharing this for a second and double check this. Nope, all right, so I'll cheat and draw one. So here is an absolutely exact representation of what your tongue looks like. And what we'll see when you look at the tongue are that there are these really large papillae called circumvallate papillae that kind of arrange in a line around the anterior two thirds of your tongue. Here on the anterior two thirds, this is the part that you move around in space. This is the part that you use to lick your ice cream cone. You use to articulate your words of speech. Uh, you use to eat and chew bubble gum and do all sorts of things like that about Back here on the posterior two thirds, the posterior, pardon me, posterior third, it's primary, per, primarily your lingual tonsils. 
these tonsils are part of your uh, lymphatic system providing body defenses back there. So if you ever look at a picture of the tongue and you should do that, uh, you'll see that the posterior third of it is really more of a defense mechanism to help to protect you from air and food and drink and harmful things that are in them. But out here on the anterior two thirds are what we use to eat, what we use to drink, all those types of things as well. Uh, there are smaller papillae along the surface of it, uh, what are known as fungiform papillae. And then there are some other papillae on here as well. Like I said, if we get to taste uh, in our um, sensory stuff, we'll get a chance to talk about this in more detail. However, one thing that we can talk about are the sensations of taste. Taste is a key, as uses chemoreceptors. So again, we get that lock in key of a chemical binding to a taste bud and allowing us to be able to perceive it. And there are five main taste sensations we are able to perceive. Now again, we combine those five taste sensations to be able to differentiate the tens of thousands of different tastes that we can, but what are the five main types of taste uh, sensations that we can perceive? Excellent, one of them is sweet, sour, salty, not spicy, although we'll get to that one in a second, bitter, and what's the fifth? There it is, excellent. Umami. Umami is by far the most recent one that has been discovered. Uh, it was actually a, a Japanese researcher who uh, first described it, and that's why uh, they use the Japanese word umami. Umami is that savory sensation uh, that you get, for instance, from like portobello mushrooms or the red juices from meat or uh, MSG. MSG is actually, uh, you know, that they put in a lot of Chinese food and things like that, it gives it that nice savory sensation, and that is umami. All right, now there are a couple quick points I want to make about these five tense taste sensations. Uh, they are mapped on the surface of your tongue. So on your tongue, uh, this area right here may be the part, uh, one of the parts where you perceive sweet. Does that mean that everybody perceives sweet in that location? Does everybody have the sweet sensation in the same location on their tongue? William Sonoma would have you believe that that's the case. Because if you go to William Sonoma, they have wine glasses there made by companies like Riedel. And Riedel, a single wine glass can be as much as $40. What could make a wine glass worth $40? Well, what happens is that wine glass is perfectly styled to the specific wine. So they have a wine glass just for Chardonnays that does two things. The first thing it does is it has just the perfect shape to the bowl so that when you have your Chardonnay in it and you swirl it, it mixes just the right amount of air to it to aerate it to maximize the flavor of that Chardonnay. But what really makes that glass so perfectly um, expensive and worth every cent of it is the lip of it is formed in a way that when you pour the wine into your mouth, it presents the wine to your tongue in just the right fashion so that it hits the different taste sensations in just the right order to maximize the flavor and intensity of that wine, enhancing the wine and making it worth every single cent. And of course, it's total BS. Yes. Yeah, excellent marketing, absolutely perfect marketing. It makes it worth very worthwhile. Every single person has a taste map on their tongue, but everybody is different. This is actually something that, again, you're bored this weekend, although you shouldn't be because you should be studying for the exam. So next weekend after the exam, while you and your family are sitting around bored, staring at each other while quarantining, a great activity to do is to map your taste receptors on your tongue. Basically, take a glass of water, rinse out your mouth, take a paper towel and dry off your tongue. Then take a Q-tip and dip it into lemon juice. As you take that, you're then going to move that, and again, rather than showing on my tongue, I'll cheat and show it on this one. You're going to take that Q-tip of lemon juice and rub it back and forth over the surface of your tongue. 
And as you do that, have a picture of your tongue sitting right next to it. And what you'll see is that you'll go, well, wow, I can taste that, sweat, that sour right here and right here and right here and right here. Then you're gonna rinse your mouth out and you're going to do the same thing again, only this time you're gonna do it with some sugar water. And what you're gonna notice this time is that you can taste that sweet here and here and here and here and here. Then you're gonna do the same thing with salt water and you'll see you taste it here and here and here and here and here. And then you're gonna use some coffee uh, so that you get that bitterness here and here and here and here. And then like I said, for umami, uh, you can use, if you're not intolerant to MSG, you can actually dissolve some MSG in water. Uh, you can use the red juices from uh, meat if you are not vegetarian uh, or not allergic to beef or anything along those lines. You can use something along those lines or, or things along those lines. And as you do that, great question. Uh, so I'll say that in just a, just a second. Um, so you will get a taste map and what you'll see is your taste map is going to be different from everybody else's in the household as well. All right. So when you burn your tongue, just like if you were to burn any part of your body, it will be damaged. But remember, your tongue is uh, covered with an epithelial tissue that repairs pretty rapidly. Uh, so like when you bite the inside of your mouth or you burn the roof of your mouth on that molten lava cheese from your hot pocket or something along those lines, in a couple of days it comes back. And the same thing will happen here, that unless that it is severe enough to cause scarring, functionality will come back. Another example of this that we see is, for instance, if you're a smoker. If you're a smoker, that smoking can damage the taste buds, but taste buds only last about a week. So if you were to stop smoking, after about a week or two, your sense of taste would come back much stronger than it was before as a result of that. So the taste buds are one of those areas where we have a high regeneration of the sensory cells. And we're not talking about neurons here, we're talking about the sensory cells that feel them, and so they're able to grow back. But I want to get back to the other concept that somebody talked about as well, and that was the concept of spicy. Notice we didn't mention spicy as one of our five taste sensations. Because remember, uh, taste sensation like sweetness is a chemical sensation. That sugar binds to a chemical receptor and turns the key. And when it turns the key, we perceive sweet. All right? Pharmaceutical companies, uh, um, Soda manufacturing companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi spend billions of dollars to try to find other chemicals that can turn that lock as well, right? That's basically what an artificial sweetener is. An artificial sweetener is something that isn't sugar, that turns the lock in the sugar and makes you perceive sweet even when it's not there. Well, that brings us to spicy. All of these chemicals are like locks and keys well, spicy, and when we talk about spicy, what's the primary uh, chemical that we associate with spicy? Anyone know? Like jalapenos, ghost peppers, all those types of things, Thai chilies. What is the chemical in those that we perceive as spicy? What's the primary chemical? Anyone know? Come on, someone's gotta know. No one, really? No adventurous buffalo wild wing eaters? Capsaicin. Capsaicin is the chemical that is in most spicy peppers. And capsaicin is basically the uh, janitor's key. And what is the janitor's key open? Janitor's key unlocks everything, exactly. So when you eat something spicy, two things occur. First, the capsaicin turns the key on all of these taste sensations, turning them all on, sending a huge, massive, confusing signal to the brain that the brain perceives as painful. There are also, as we talked about, tactile, oops, and temperature receptors of the tongue. And our capsaicin stimulates those as well. And so it is perceived as hot, it is perceived as painful, right? That's why you get all sweaty when you eat that spicy food. 
because your brain is being tricked into thinking it's really, really hot, right? And so that just like if you drink a large cup of coffee, right, you get warm as a result of that. Well, these peppers give that same sensation. And so you can get sweaty as a result of it. It gets painful from the tactile. It, it tricks this into thinking it's painful. It's confusing from all of it. And so we get this big, huge, massive response from this janitor key switching all the switches. All right. Questions on that? Excellent. So that is our facial nerve. And again, as we mentioned, uh, it is going to get where it needs to go. Oops, not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. By that tiny little, I don't like grab button, let's go red. Let's go yellow. That tiny little bone feature, the temporal bone right there, that uh, stylomastoid foramen. All right, questions on that? All right, I want to point out one more thing about seven. Remember, as we saw here, we have six, no, no, I do want black. Six, seven, and eight are all here down here together below the pawns. But as I mentioned, six is by itself, and seven and eight hang out as BFS, really close together, all right? Because while it comes out the stylomastoid foramen, if we cheat and look at the inside of the skull, did we find an opening for the stylomastoid foramen in the inside of the skull? Can we see the stylomastoid foramen from the inside of the skull here? No, we can't. And the reason for that is it doesn't open to the inside of the skull. What it opens is to the inside of the temporal bone. Remember here inside of the temporal bone, we have some magical things, a big magical black box that allows us to hear and allows us to maintain balance. If you remember, we talked about how this opening right here, the internal auditory meatus are where the nerves come in to that black box so that information can come out. And remember out here, the external auditory meatus is where sound comes in. And as that sound comes in, it gets processed by that magic box and then gets carried into the brain. Well, what we'll see here on this next picture as we move from seven to eight is why seven and eight are BFFs. If you notice seven, even though it's been cut, follows eight into the temporal bone. It goes through the internal auditory meatus. And then what happens is it continues to go down and then goes out the external, uh, pardon me, out the stylomastoid foramen. So seven and eight are BFFs. They actually enter into the temporal bone together, but we don't care where they enter. We care where they exit and where seven exits is that external stylomastoid frame on the outside of the temporal bone. All right, questions on that? All right, let's talk eight. Eight is a tricky one. Cranial nerve eight. What is the name of cranial nerve eight? Excellent, vestibular cochlear. Which is a mouthful and a half. Back in ancient, ancient times, and by ancient, ancient times, I mean when I was in graduate school, when I had learned my mnemonic, we actually, my mnemonic for this one has an A in this one and not a V, because way back in ancient times, cranial nerve eight was known as the auditory nerve. However, the auditory nerve doesn't really do service to everything that it does. So they have completely wiped auditory nerve off the face of the planet, and instead given us this huge alphabet soup term 
vestibular cochlear, which is so much harder to uh, spell, but like many of our alphabet soup terms, it tells us everything about it. What is the functional type of cranial nerve eight? Sensory, motor, or both? Sensory, excellent. And in fact, it's sensory, but really, when we talk about its specific function, there isn't one, but two different types of sensory information that we get from cranial nerve eight. And that's why they stopped using auditory nerve to describe it, because it didn't do a service to both of these things. There are two special sensory structures. One of these sensory structures is known as the vestibule, As you can see here, as we look at the vestibule, the vestibule, and let me highlight it here in, oh, we'll use green. This structure over here is the vestibule. And this vestibule is actually what gives us our equilibrium and our balance. Now, what do I mean by equilibrium and balance? Anyone know? Well, let me ask the question this way. If you, like me, were sitting in an office chair and I were to take you, there you go, standing up without swaying is definitely one example of it. If I put you in my office chair that I'm sitting in now and I spun you around 17 times and then I asked you to run across the room, would that be something that would be easy for you to do? No. Or if you were in an elevator and the elevator has no windows and the door is closed, and the elevator starts to move. Can you tell if the elevator is going up or if the elevator is going down? Yeah. Yeah. Those sensations, those ability to be able to feel movement, to be able to maintain balance, that is what our vestibule does for us. It provides us with our equilibrium and our balance. The cochlea, is this big, huge snail shell looking structure that's been cut to show us the fanciness of it, but it is this big, huge snail shell looking structure. And the cochlea is what gives us our sense of hearing. And that's why calling this the auditory nerve isn't acceptable because hearing is only half of what it does. It does both hearing and equilibrium and balance. In fact, many of the models that you will see for this will sometimes split the vestibular cochlear nerve into two branches. You'll see two branches coming off of this nerve, one being the one going to the vestibule, one being the one going to the cochlea. Now notice our model maker, our artist has it wrong, they put the second one on seven and not on eight the way they were supposed to. But again, our artists can't always be perfect. The models do a little bit better job of that. All right. So we have a name, we have a functional type, we have a specific function. We do have one issue. Our skull exit is supposed to be where it exits the skull. Does the vestibular cochlear nerve actually exit the skull? No, it actually goes into the temporal bone and stops. So it never technically exits the skull, but what it does do is it exits the cranial cavity. It does exit the cranial cavity to go into the skull. So since it does exit the cranial cavity, we will use that internal acoustic or auditory meatus as our skull exit for cranial nerve eight. Technically, it doesn't leave the skull, but it does leave the cranial cavity. There is a hole in the skull that it passes through to get through to its destination. 
And so we will use the internal auditory or internal acoustic meatus or canal. Remember that was acceptable as well as its skull exit. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So notice as we've been working our way and we'll start here. Six, seven, eight. And then notice we just continue down the side with nine, 10 and 11. Now, one of the things that I wanna show you, actually, let me see. Now that I think about it. There we go. Perfect. That's what I wanted. If, as you hopefully have been doing, you've been going to that virtual anatomy lab that Cosumnes River College has provided for us. Here, notice we can see all of our cranial nerves on a model, and I guarantee models like this will be on your exam. So make sure you have familiarized yourself with it. And notice, and we'll do this with a highlighter to make sure that we can emphasize them. Here is the olfactory bulb. Notice we don't actually see cranial nerve one on this, we just know that cranial nerve one would come off of this structure. So cranial nerve one would be those axons that come off of the olfactory bulb. But the rest of our cranial nerves are here. Here is two. Notice here on the midline above the pons is three. And then here coming from the backside is four. Here is five. Here is six. Here is seven, here is eight. And notice eight, you can see they've kind of divided it a little bit. And what I wanted to show you this model is I wanted to show you this right here. Notice this right here is nine, 10, and 11. Notice our illustration, actually let me undo that one and do it down here. I'll color it down here so we can see it, but we'll take a look at it up here. Notice our illustration has done a nice job of really separating 9, 10, and 11 to really differentiate them. If you look closely at the model here, you can say because, see because of the differences of heights that they're dividing this into three structures. So this here is nine, this here is 10, and this one here is 11. So you can see that they're differentiated, but notice that all the axons are kind of put together. And that's not on accident these three do kind of come together to form one structure that leaves the brain. So not surprisingly, because these three are all buddy-buddy, they all have the same skull exit. So the same way that there were four nerves that went through the superior orbital fissure, here we have three nerves that are all gonna go to the exact same location as well. And then of course, lastly, just to make sure we emphasize it, here is cranial nerve 12. Notice also, again, here we can clearly see the pyramids between 12 and notice here in pink, uh, you can see that pink olive, I only colored a little bit of it, but that pink olive that is between uh, 12 and nine, 10 and 11. All right, so here we see this in the pretty picture, but when we go back to here, we see that notice they've emphasized the difference of them, but they often go together and that's useful to remember because they're all going to have the same skull exit. All right, so let's start first with the most superior one, that is nine. Uh, nine is the glossopharyngeal, another big mouthful, but again, it tells you a lot about it. Pharyngeal refers to the pharynx, the throat. Glosso refers to the tongue. And so notice it's going to the posterior part of the tongue. Glossopharyngeal, what is its functional type? Sensory, motor, or both? Both, excellent. So that means it is gonna have both a sensory function and a motor function. From a sensory standpoint, basically, I'm gonna put this, and I want some space to write this, so let's spread this out. 
I'm going to say chemical taste. What I mean by this is it's not the sweet, the sour, the salty, those types of things that we talked about. But what it does give us is some sensation of chemicals. Notice it only innervates the posterior uh, part of the tongue, but also the roof of the mouth and even some of the esophagus. If you're really eating a really good mint chocolate chip ice cream, can you taste that mint chocolate chip all the way in the back of your throat? Feel the, taste the mintiness of it? No. But if you're drinking a really acidic red wine, can you kind of sense that pH on the roof of your mouth and the back of your throat as you're drinking that substance that is really, really acidic? Yeah. So this gives us kind of a rough chemical sensation, things like pH, uh, certain substrates, uh, am certain amino acids or some certain uh, uh, um, um, fatty acids and things like that can be sensed by the roof of the mouth, by our throat, uh, by the posterior part of our tongue. But also it gives us chemical sensation from the blood as well. If you notice, there is a sensory structure here known as the carotid bodies. This carotid body uh, basically gives us a lot of the chemical composition of the blood. Remember as we talked about, do we need to know how much calcium is in the blood? Do we need to know the pH of the blood? Do we need to know how much glucose is in the blood? Yes, but how many of you right now are actually consciously aware of exactly how much calcium is in your blood? Does anybody know exactly how much calcium they, has on, they have in their blood? No, this isn't information we're constantly, I mean, we're consciously aware of, but does our nervous system need to be monitoring the condition of the blood so we can make changes? Absolutely. So that's why I kind of use and quote that chemical taste. It's given us this general chemical information, both from the oral cavity, but also from the blood as well. Notice from a motor standpoint, it plays an important role in controlling muscles of the pharynx and larynx. Uh, so that plays an important role in uh, swallowing and speech. So it plays an important role in our ability to be able to swallow and our ability to produce speech. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So what we need then is we need a skull feature that would be large enough that would allow not just one, not just two, but three nerves to pass through it. Might such a thing exist? Do we have a, and I'll say it again, skull feature that might be big enough that it might make a good skull exit for cranial nerves nine, 10, and 11? Well, I'm asking the question, so the obviously answer should be yes. So maybe, I don't know, something like a notch in the occipital bone and a notch in the temporal bone, forming a nice big opening that three nerves could find their way through. There you go, the jugular foramen. The jugular foramen is the skull exit for 9, 10, and 11. All right, questions on that? All right, let's move to 10. What is 10 again? What's the name of 10? Vegas. What does Vegas mean? To lose lots of money? Is that what Vegas means? 
It's usually what it means. Steal the Raiders. Is that what Vegas means? What does Vegas mean? Anyone know? Vegas comes from the same root of the word vagabond, and it means to wander, right? If you think about it, six we said was the smallest, five we said was the largest. But if you look at the illustration here, you can see that vagus nerve is by far the longest of all of our cranial nerves. Basically, if you look at this illustration to the right, you can see that it goes to pretty much to almost every organ in the ventral body cavity. Throat, larynx, heart, lungs, stomach, spleen, kidney, small intestine, large intestine, liver, gallbladder. Practically every organ in the ventral body cavity. So it truly is a wanderer going absolutely everywhere. Now, as we will talk about next week, our vagus nerve is responsible for about 90% of all of our parasympathetic output. So basically that is control of our visceral organs. However, from a functional type standpoint, is our vagus nerve sensory, motor, or both? It's both. So if we're talking in terms of cranial nerves, the simple answer to what its specific function is, is that we can say that it uh, receives sensory oops, information from and provides motor control to most organs in the ventral body cavity. I will accept that as your definition if I ask you the specific function of this nerve. Now, next week when we're talking about the peripheral nervous system, we will talk about specific branches of the parasympathetic pathways and specific pathways in them that we'll describe in details. So if we're talking about something like that, we'll have to get a little bit more sophisticated. But uh, for right now, when we're just talking about our cranial nerve and uh, cranial nerve 10 in particular, uh, this is an acceptable definition for its specific function. But like I said, next week you'll learn everything you wanted to know about uh, the parasympathetic nervous system and more. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. And then, of course, what is the skull exit of cranial nerve 10? Jugular foramen, there you go. That same nice big opening. Jugular foramen is its skull exit. All righty, excellent. Let's look at cranial nerve 11. What is the name of cranial nerve 11? Excellent, that is exactly what I wanted to see. It is known as the accessory nerve, but it is also known as the spinal accessory nerve. Both of these are acceptable terms. Notice the mnemonic I gave you is uses A for accessory nerve, but many of the mnemonics you may find will have the term spinal accessory for the name. Both of these are acceptable terms for cranial nerve 11. And the one nice thing about the spinal accessory nerve name is it tells you a very interesting piece of information about this cranial nerve. 
This cranial nerve are, is a cranial nerve because all cranial nerves come off the brain stem. However, what's interesting about cranial nerve 11 is that while indeed some axons come out of the brain stem, others actually come off the spinal cord. So this is the only cranial nerve that actually can start outside of the skull. In fact, if you look closely, what you see is that some of the axons come off the spinal cord and have to go back into the skull before they can leave the skull. So notice they enter the skull. So some axons enter the skull via the foramen magnum. But all of them exit the skull by what? What is the skull exit? Axon, the skull exit. Oops, hold on. Is the jugular foramen. Excellent. So some of them actually come back up into the skull before they leave the skull. Others start in the skull and then come out. So that's why it gets the funky name. Now, what is our functional type of cranial nerve 11? Motor. And as we see nicely from the illustration, we see what it does. What cranial nerve 11 does is it controls the muscles that stabilize the head and hold the head in place. In particular, as you can see here from the illustration, it helps to control the trapezius muscle and the sternocleidomastoid. Remember, those are definitely muscles that we talked about that help to stabilize the head and hold the head in place. And that is what our spinal accessory does. It allows us to help us to hold our head in space. All right. Questions on that? Excellent. Just, uh, Go ahead. Question. Yep. Just, uh, did you mention the special function? What do you mean by the special function? Usually there's a function, uh, function, uh, function type and then... Oh, the specific function. Yes. Yeah, sorry. The, the specific function is to hold the neck in place. So you can say, again, you can say it one of two ways. You can say it controls the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius, or you can say it stabilizes the head and holds the head in place. That is the specific function. The specific function is to hold the head in space or to control the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. All right. Any other questions? Excellent. And of course, as we mentioned, jugular foramen is its skull exit. And that brings us to cranial nerve 12, our last one. What is the name of cranial nerve 12? Hypoglossal. And again, a lot is in the name. Hypo means below. Glossal, as we talked about, is tongue. Now, we have already moved the, I mean, pardon me, we have already done taste both in the front and the back. We have got tactile sensation. We've done all of those things. But so clearly, the last thing we need to do, and again, what is the functional type of cranial nerve 12? Motor. The specific function of cranial nerve 12 is to move to tongue, the tongue. Now we do need to be a little bit more specific than this in that it controls both the intrinsic and extrinsic I spelled that one wrong too, didn't I? Yep, 
intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the tongue. Let's see if we can make sense of what that means. And for that, let's go back to our drawing. Perfect. Excellent. Now, again, I need to draw a tongue again, but I'll just cheat and erase the previous one because it's fun to draw. There we go. There's our tongue. There are basically two types of muscles in the tongue. Intrinsic, and as the name indicates, intrinsic muscles are muscles that are entirely contained in the tongue. So for instance, there may be fascicles that uh, go from left and right through here, or go through the tongue there, or across the tongue this way, right? They're gonna be at all sorts of different angles to them there. Whereas there are also extrinsic muscles of the tongue. And these are muscles that start in the tongue, but anchor outside of the tongue. And in fact, if I really think back, what is the primary anchor for most of these extrinsic muscles of the tongue? If we have these muscles that start in the tongue and come out and attach to something, what do most of these extrinsic muscles actually attach to? Does anybody remember? If only I had a special bone that didn't form any joints and uh, acted as the movable base of the tongue. There you go. The hyoid bone. Excellent. The primary anchor for most of these extrinsic muscles is the hyoid bone. Isn't it fun how the things we learned earlier we get to use again? It is an enjoyable experience. Absolutely. So the last thing we need to talk about is what are the functions of these? What is the function of an extrinsic muscle? What do extrinsic muscles do? No. Extrinsic muscles move your tongue through space. Can you stick your tongue out? Move it left, move it right, up, down, all around that ability to move your tongue through space is what the function of the extrinsic muscles do. Well, if that's the case, then what does an extrinsic muscle do? What is the function of an extrinsic muscle? Anyone want to hazard a guess? How many of you can roll your tongue or put ripples on your tongue or turn it upside down, change the shape of your tongue, make it flat, make it round? That's what intrinsic muscles do. Intrinsic muscles change the shape of your tongue. All right. So again, if you want to speak eloquently, be that cunning linguist, you need to be able to both change the shape of your tongue and also move your tongue around in space. And it is the hypoglossal nerve that allows you to do both. All right, questions on that? I have a question. What do you guys think the skull exit of the hypoglossal nerve is? There you go, epsilon. Hypoglossal canal of the occipital bone. So if we go back to our illustration, notice they cheat and put a teeny bit of it here. But again, remember, uh, this illustration doesn't show it quite as well. But if you remember, I need my annotations. There we go. Here, superior to the condyle, remember of our occipital bone, is a small passageway. So we know it's there. However, I do have a picture, this one from your 
uh, atlas that again doesn't do the bestest job of showing it but again uh, kind of emphasizes where it would be located above superior to that occipital condyle which is where that hypoglossal canal is located. Excellent. And just that simply, we have gone through all of our cranial nerves. Excellent. Questions on that? Yeah, quick question. Uh, I'm sorry, did you say that the uh, skull exit is the hypoglossal canal? I didn't, Alexa did, but I agreed with her. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, the skull exit of the hypoglossal nerve is the hypoglossal canal. Any other questions? All right, so going into the weekend now, you have been armed with all the information you need for that 25% of your lab exam. And like I said, I'm sure some of this stuff will find its way onto your uh, lecture exam as well. We have done the 50% that is the central nervous system anatomy. So we've covered 75% of what's gonna be on your lab exam, and obviously a lot of what's gonna be on your lecture exam. So then next week, we need to start with the autonomic nervous system. However, we are not actually done for today. We do need to finish up the spinal nerves. Now that we've done the cranial nerves, while we don't have to know as much about the spinal nerves, there is some basic information we need to talk about there. And we need to go back to that idea of a reflex and talk about what a reflex is and describe that as well. Uh, so that's all we'll do for today. I think looking at the time, I don't want to start uh, the autonomic nervous system and get too far into it. So I think uh, what our best bet is going to be is to take one last break, finish off the spinal cord, and then depending on where we are, we may call it a day, even though it may be a little bit early at that point, uh, because I think uh, two days should be enough time to get to the autonomic. It means we're not going to get to the sensory stuff, uh, but we were already behind since day one, so I didn't think we'd get to too much of that. We'll see how far we go. But I think we'll save the autonomic for next week and then anything else that we need to get to as well. So let's take one last break. As we come back from this last break, uh, we will then finish up the rest of the spinal cord uh, discussion. Like I said, talking about those plexes we left off talking about, uh, some of the spinal nerves, and then ultimately finishing off with reflexes. All right, what time is it? It is 10.37. Uh, so 15 to that is going to be uh, 52. So let's come back and start at 10.52. And I will start the recording at that point. All righty, any other questions? All right, I'll see you in 15 minutes. So as I mentioned, the last thing we need to do for today is finish up our discussion of the spinal nerves. Again, as we talked about, we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. As we talked about, all of them are mixed nerves. So again, if you were gonna come up with a mnemonic, you would just need a sentence that was 31 words long where they all started with B because both for all of them, because every single one is a mixed nerve. But what we were talking about is that that spinal nerve branches almost immediately when it comes out, forming four branches. And again, if we cheat back to the previous picture, we can see those four branches. We have the dorsal ramus, the ventral ramus. Uh, and again, I will emphasize and point out that these are incorrect on this illustration. Uh, remember, the lateral ramus is the white ramus and the medial ramus is the gray ramus. So don't worry, when we get to the autonomic nervous system and that actually matters, the pictures we have will be correct. Uh, so this one they've got twisted, they've got that backwards. So again, feel free to ignore that. Uh, but um, those are the four ramy. And as we talked about, and as we were looking at here, the largest of the ramy is the ventral ramy. And with a few exceptions, those a few exceptions being here in the thoracic region, where that nerve basically comes out and just goes along the costal groove of the rib, most of the ventral ramy branch elaborately to form these elaborate plexes. And so as I mentioned, there are four main plexes. For each plexus, we are going to identify the plexus by name. We are going to identify uh, which 
uh, spinal nerves, or what we'll call the roots, are going to form them. We are going to identify the part of the body that they innervate. And then the last one is we will identify one or more specific nerves uh, that you will need to know the function of. Now, you are not going to have to identify these plexis on the lab exam. You are not going to have to identify these specific nerves on the lab exam. So I'm not going to point at one of these nerves and know what it is. This is primarily a lecture only material that we are covering here. So again, I'm not gonna show you this elaborate, the spider web looking structure. Uh, normally I would if we were in the classroom, but uh, you don't get to do that today. Uh, so we are not gonna just focus on the functionality of these things. So let's do that. Starting with our first plexus. That first plexus is the cervical plexus. And as you can see, the cervical plexus is made up of roots ventral rami that are coming out of C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. It forms this elaborate, scary looking um, bundle of nerves, this particular plexus here. And as you can see from our illustration, these primarily innervate uh, the muscles of the head, neck, and shoulders. Notice our accessory nerve, which remember goes to the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius, not surprisingly, comes and becomes a part of this elaborate plexus. But there is one interesting nerve that I want to point out to you, and that is this one, the phrenic nerve. Notice the phrenic nerve is comprised of Ramey's C3, C4, and C5. And anyone have any idea what the phrenic nerve innervates? What it does? Anyone know what the phrenic nerve innervates? What it controls? My microphone is on, right? You guys can hear me? No one's heard of the phrenic nerve before? Neck might be a good guess, absolutely. We do think of this being the head, neck, and shoulder region. So it is kind of in here, this region. And of course, being in this region, it should not be at all surprising that the phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm. Wait, where's the diaphragm again? Where's your diaphragm? Yeah, way down here below the ribs. Way down here below the ribs is where your diaphragm is. Is that head, neck, and shoulders? No. So why? Why is this nerve so horribly placed or misplaced? Yeah, breathing. It controls the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the primary muscle responsible for breathing. And how important is breathing? On a scale of one to 10, two, three, 11. There you go, I like that. 12, excellent, absolutely. Breathing is vitally important, right? Now, one of the things that happens is being uh, especially females, tended to be more arboreal from an evolutionary standpoint. But as you're running around outside in the world, and the world is a scary place, it is easy to get injured, is it easy to get damaged, it is easy to fall. And as it turns out, most of our vertebral column injuries occur from C7 down. If, for instance, you happen to be, oh, I don't know, maybe you play Superman, in a couple of movies and then one day you're out riding your horse and your horse bucks you off and you damage the middle part of your back and you spend the rest of your life in a wheelchair because you are incapable of controlling the lower half of your body. 
or maybe you get it in the upper back and what happens is you suddenly are paralyzed from the neck down what do we call someone who isn't able to feel anything or or move anything from their neck down a quadriplegic absolutely right they can't move their hands they can't move their feet right they can't move their shoulders they have trouble uh, avoiding their urine and defecating things along those lines are challenging for them they basically can't move the only thing they can move is from the head up but are they able to breathe yeah that quadriplegic is able to breathe the advantage of having that misplaced phrenic nerve is it controls the diaphragm and diaphragm allows you to breathe and since breathing is so important, we want it in a more protected location. By having it coming off of such a superior part of the vertebral column, it is in a much more protected location and is typically located above the area where most uh, spinal cord injuries occur. In fact, the mnemonic for it, to help you remember it, is with the phrenic nerve. It's made up of Ramey's roots C3, 4, and 5, and it keeps you alive because it controls your diaphragm. So it is horribly misplaced, but for a vitally important reason. All right, questions on that? All right, let's look at our second plexus. The second plexus is our brachial plexus. It is an incredibly beautiful, right? Stare in awe at the brachial plexus here. It is a truly amazing structure. Right, uh, be in awe. If we were in the classroom, if we had the time, I would actually make you learn and draw this plexus because it is so damn beautiful. It starts with roots C4 through T1. Those then become three trunks. Those three trunks become two divisions. Those divisions become three cords. And from there, all these elaborate branches come off of it. Again, it's got this beautiful organization to it uh, that you can see here really, really nicely of how that works. And unfortunately, because of time, we are not gonna have the opportunity to talk about the roots and trunks and division and cords, and uh, you don't have to know any of those things. However, what I do wanna briefly mention is the six important nerves that come off of it, especially because they're ones we've basically talked about already. So really, this is kind of a callback to some of the information we have already talked about. Here we see again that brachial plexus. And again, let's just make sure we're comfortable with the information. It is made up of roots C4 through T1. And I think it's pretty obvious at this point, it basically innervates uh, the muscles of the arm. So let's talk about the examples. We've learned the muscles of the arm. Let's see some of these nerves in action. For starters, the musculocutaneous nerve, which we see here, is an anterior nerve. It's yellow, so it's for the front of the arm. And it's responsible for uh, controlling the flexors of your elbow. There were three main flexors of the elbow you learned. What were they? What were the three muscles you learned that flexed your elbow? I hate it when we have to use things we've learned in other parts of the class and different parts of the class. Excellent. Bicep break is the big one, the obvious one. Of course, there was that deep muscle beneath it that basically did the exact same thing. What was that one? It was deep brachialis. And there was the brachioradialis. Excellent. Perfect. Those three muscles are all innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. Notice here we have the median and the ulnar nerves, anterior nerves that go down the wrist down to the hand. So these affect the wristers, the wrist flexors and the hand flexors, uh, like the flexor carpi radialis and the flexor carpi ulnaris and the palmaris longus. All of those that we talked about are controlled by that. Remember, we also talked about something really interesting. Actually, let's talk about this one first, the radial nerve. The radial nerve, notice is green. That indicates it is a posterior uh, nerve. So not surprisingly, it controls the extensors of the shoulder and elbow. And what was the primary extensor of the shoulder and the elbow that we learned? The 
what one, there you go, the triceps brachia, excellent, is innervated by the radial nerve. Now let's take a look at the radial nerve for a moment. As I mentioned, you see it is a posterior nerve. It starts in the back, it ends up in the back. But notice when it gets to the elbow, when it gets to the elbow, it actually comes to the front of the elbow so that it can be protected by the elbow joint and then go back to the back of the arm again. Because that's smart. You want to be protected in that elbow joint. That makes a lot of sense. However, then we have this pesky fella right here, the ulnar nerve. Notice the ulnar nerve is an anterior nerve. Oh, hold on, that probably doesn't show up. It is an anterior nerve that starts in the anterior of the arm. And in the elbow, instead of staying anterior and being protected, that pesky little bugger goes around the outside of the medial condyle before it comes back to the front again, putting it in a very precarious exposed location, which if you happen to bump in just the right or really just the wrong way, everybody else finds it hilarious. And what do we call that irritation of the ulnar nerve? We call it hitting your funny bone. There you go, exactly, hitting your funny bone. So it is that ulnar nerve that is that funny bone because it's in that weird exposed position. Notice proximally we have the axillary nerve. This is the one, notice it's coming lateral here, it innervates the deltoid, innervates the teres minor. And one more, we don't see it as well from this image, but I'll cheat and I'll draw it. Coming off of the inferior part of our brachial plexus is a nerve that comes down here to the ribs, innervating those ribs and the, those muscles, that, that muscle that connects to the ribs and goes back to the medial border of the scapula. And that of course is the, oops, long thoracic nerve. Here is that long thoracic nerve. Oops, sorry. Here is the long thoracic nerve right here. And that long thoracic nerve goes to the serratus anterior. All righty. So there you go. So there we've briefly identified six of the um, nerves of the brachial plexus and identified some of the muscles that we've learned that it innervates. All right, excellent. Our third plexus is the lumbar plexus made up of a ventral ramus L1 through L5. Notice it's not as nearly elaborately branched as the first two that we looked at are and it innervates, as you can see, uh, the abdominal wall, the external genitalia, and the anterior medial part of the thigh. One of the important nerves that is here, and this one isn't so much as important from a functional standpoint as it is from a clinical standpoint, is, whoops, where did it go? Is, there it is, we see it here, the femoral nerve, although I think I like it showing it here better, better, what about that, try that again show it better here, femoral nerve. One of the important things about the femoral nerve is its location. Notice it sits here, it comes out underneath the inguinal ligament. Remember that inguinal ligament basically goes from the superior anterior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. It's an attachment point for, uh, for muscles and things along those lines. And coming out underneath it is the femoral nerve, which is important, but sitting right next to the femoral nerve is a big, large artery. And sitting right next to that is a big, large vein. The femoral artery, the femoral nerve, and the femoral vein all come out at the same location of that inguinal ligament in a region that is actually called the femoral triangle. As a clinician or an EMT or just some, a good Samaritan walking down the street, 
If you come along someone who's had their leg mangled and is losing a whole lot of blood, you want to start to stop that blood loss. And one of the ways you can do that is with a tourniquet. However, if it's not possible to put a tourniquet on an individual, what you can do is you can actually palpate this femoral triangle region. You then take the palm of your hand and put it in that femoral triangle region, and it actually stops the blood flow and can help to maintain the integrity of the leg. Uh, well, not the integrity of the leg, but help to hopefully keep the person alive from losing too much blood. The problem with that technique, and again, I'm not encouraging you to run out of the street and do this, you know, obviously you, you will be trained to do this, but this is something that occurs. The problem with this technique is often in the uh, excitement of the situation, the pressure can become too great. And if you put too great of a pressure on that femoral triangle, yes, you stop the blood loss, but the problem is that you can actually damage that femoral nerve. And of course, living in the litigious society that we do, you save somebody's life, but now they have a limp because of it, and you're going to get sued. So remember, any time before you save somebody's life, make sure they sign the waiver first. All right. Questions on that? There's actually a good Samaritan law for that. <laughs> no, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously I'm speaking in hyperbole, but, but uh, it is unfortunately something that can occur. That, that again, in ironically, in saving someone's life, uh, you can also crush that nerve and then lead, you know, and then they get a limp for the most of life. But I think a choice between being dead and having a limp, I think most people would pick the limp. But we do live in a litigious society. All right. But that's why you should all become teachers like me and not bother becoming nurses because being a nurse is scary. <laughs> all right. All righty. Excellent. Our last plexus is the least elaborate. Notice it has the least amount of branching, at least amount of, you know, entanglement going on here. And this is our sacral plexus. It is made up of the ventral ramies from L4 through S5 in there and it forms nerves that primarily innervate uh, the buttocks, the perineum, and the posterior part of the upper leg and the lower extremity. It is the least elaborate of our plexes, but it also is the home of our largest nerve. And of course that largest nerve is the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve, as you look at the picture, actually has two branches to it, but those two branches fuse together into a single structure that runs the entire length of the leg all the way down onto the foot. As we know, that sciatic nerve comes out underneath the greater sciatic notch, and even though the picture doesn't show it, it passes through a large number of the muscles of the back on its way there. And that's the problem. From an evolutionary standpoint, standing upright is a relatively new behavior. And so the musculature of our back isn't necessarily as efficient as it could be. So if you are uh, sitting in your chair too often, too much, like we do for this class, uh, my wife wants to give me one of those walking desks so I can uh, be like on the treadmill while I'm lecturing to you guys. Um, or you're lifting heavy boxes inappropriately or, or, or doing other types of activity, activities that irritate the muscles of the back, as the muscles of the back become irritated, they can squeeze and pinch this nerve. And what do we call that condition? Sciatica, absolutely. That sciatica can lead to painful tingling sensations, a weakness, uh, numbness that run uh, basically the entire, not just from the small of your back, but down the entire length of your leg all the way down to the foot. And yes, I agree with Madison. Sciatica is not a tremendous amount of fun, not the way that I recommend you spend the weekend. All right. Although the muscle relaxants that they give you for it are pretty damn good. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Those then are our four plexes, the parts of the body they innervate, the ventral rami that they are formed by, and just some of the nerves associated with them. 
All right, now, again, hopefully what you're getting from this is that these nerves are not, spinal nerves are not random in where they go. They go to specific locations of your body. And we can actually map that. The map of where the spinal nerves go in your body are what are known as the dermatomes. Here we see a distribution of the nerves in an adult body. It's slightly different in an adolescent body, but not too different. This is important for a couple of reasons. It is important, obviously, to understand how the body is innervated. But again, from a clinical standpoint, uh, this can be really important if someone is wheeled in, as we talked about, with a spinal cord injury. One of the quick ways you can assess that individual is by the sensations they have. Basically, you start on the bottom of the foot and you touch the foot and touch these areas. Can you feel this? Yes. Can you feel this? Yes. Can you feel this? Yes. Can you feel this? No. What about this? Yes. What about this? No. What about this? Yes. What about this? No. What about this? Yes. What about this? No. And you realize quick, very quickly you can access that obviously the injury to the spinal cord is between the L2 and the L3 region of the spinal cord. The other place this becomes significant are things like retroviruses. Shingles is probably one of the best examples because again, it's all popular now on the news and people are talking about it again. Uh, shingles is a condition that can be associated with um, uh, kind of a reoccurrence of the uh, chickenpox virus in a way. Uh, but what the key with uh, shingles is it is a retrovirus. What that means is it is actually living in your spinal cord. And what happens is, and again, the triggers can vary. Uh, some, most of the triggers are stress-related, uh, but it can be other things like temperature, diet, other things. What'll happen is that virus then expresses itself back out the nerve. And when it does that, because it is living in a specific portion of your spinal cord, it just expresses itself in that one single dermatome, although that one's a little too big, so let's try this again. So what'll happen is it may just express itself if it's living in the T7, T8 region of the spinal cord, then you will get this red rash-like appearance that only occurs in like a strip of your skin. So instead of being all over the place like a normal rash, it stays very restricted to that region because it's not actually associated with the skin, it's actually a retrovirus coming out your spinal cord through those nerves. So again, those are some of the ways that this is, can be important from a clinical standpoint. All right, questions on that? All right, the last thing then that we need to talk about for today are our reflexes. And we're gonna focus on spinal reflexes, but let's talk first about reflexes. How do you define a reflex? What are the key characteristics to a reflex? Okay, excellent. One of the keys is you do it without thinking, right? It is involuntary, unconscious, right? So it's not something that we think about. What is the advantage of the fact that we don't have to think about it? Or what's one of the advantages that we don't have to think about? It's fast. fast. Absolutely, right? If I put my hand on something hot, I don't want that information coming all the way up to my brain to go, hey, your hand is in pain. And then I can process that information. Oh, wow, my hand's in pain. That really sucks. I should probably do something about it. Yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. What do you think we should do? Oh, and I remove it? Sure, that sounds like a great idea. And we send a, figure, a signal to the hand to remove it at that point. Right? At that point, it's burnt away. Instead, I touch it and I pull it away without even being consciously aware of it before I'm aware that I even should be uh, cursing yet. So, right, so it's involuntary. It isn't something that I have to consciously think about. Uh, the second adv advantage of that is that it is fast. What's the third advantage to a reflex? Obviously, touching something hot and pulling it away is an example. Where's another great example of where someone uses or takes advantage or triggers one of your reflexes. There you go, I like it, predictable. The doctor's office. One of the things that you do is, the first thing you do is you sit down on the uh, bench and the doctor comes up and hits you in the knee. 
And when he hits you in the knee with a hammer, what happens? Your leg kicks out, exactly. And then he hits you in the knee with the other, I mean, the other knee with a hammer. And what happens? That leg kicks out, right? If he, hits, if he hits you in the knee with a hammer and your arm goes up in the air, you're getting further testing, right? Because the other big key important factor in reflexes is not only that they're fast, not only that they're involuntary, but they are predictable. So that is really the key to a reflex. The advantage of reflexes is that they are fast, they are involuntary, and they are predictable. Right. Reflexes come in different flavors. Right? And again, when we're talking about spinal reflexes, obviously we are processing that information in the gray matter of the spinal cord. But we can also have cranial reflexes. So obviously the difference between a spinal reflex and a cranial reflex is where the gray matter is located. Or we can think of it as where we process the information. Typically for reflexes, it is either going to be in the gray matter of the spinal cord for spinal reflexes, or it is typically in nuclei of the cerebrum and brainstem. Stem. So one of the big ways um, reflexes can be different is where they process. We can have spinal reflexes and cranial reflexes. The example of hitting you in the knee with a hammer, would that be spinal or would that be cranial? Spinal. If I shine a light in your eye to see if it reacts to the light, would that be spinal or would that be cranial? That would be cranial. Excellent. All right. Another way that reflexes can be different is if they can be somatic or they can be autonomic. What do you think the difference is here? Well, let's go back to our two examples. If I hit you in the knee with the hammer, do you think that's somatic or do you think that that's autonomic? There you go, it's somatic because what it is controlling is skeletal muscle. However, when I shine the light in your eye and your eye constricts, what's the effector there? Smooth muscle of the eye. So autonomic are the ones that are smooth muscle, uh, cardiac muscle, or glands. So basically the difference between somatic and autonomic is what is the effector, All right? What is the effector? And that determines whether or not it is somatic or it is autonomic. Excellent. Some reflexes are innate and some are learned or acquired. What does it mean to be innate? Is it you're born with? Yeah, exactly, right? Gaga had it correct. You're born that way, right? That is an innate reflex. You can take a baby, rip it out of the womb, and as it is three seconds old, you can touch its cheek. And when you touch that three second old baby in the cheek, what is that baby gonna do? Anyone know? Well, yeah, exactly. What, uh, well, it's not gonna cry necessarily, although they, they do cry from the movie and they do get disrupted by that. But no, if you touch that newborn baby on the cheek, exactly. What'll happen is that stimulus causes the baby to turn to it and causes it to try to latch on because it thinks it's getting fed, it's gonna to try to get milk. And so that's what we actually call the suckle reflex, right? Where it tries to latch on right away and start sucking right away. That is an innately learned reflex. However, if you take that same three second old baby, put it into the driver's seat of a car, have it drive down the street, 
and then suddenly have a kid chasing a beach ball run out in front of the baby. Will that baby both slam on the brakes and put their hand out to protect the person next to them at the exact same time in that three week, that three second old baby? No. Or if you are trying to teach your teenager to drive and you're sitting in the passenger side and that car pulls out right in front of you and you go to slam on the brake even though there's no brake on the passenger side. Right? Those are all examples of learned or my favorite example, knock, knock. Knock, knock. Who's there? There you go. Pavlov, just checking. There you go. I know. Again, psychology jokes horrible. But who was Pavlov? Anyone know? Yeah, he was the dog guy. Exactly. He would give a steak to a dog and ring a bell. And when the dog saw the steak, he would salivate. And then he'd give him a steak and ring a bell and give him a steak and ring a bell. And eventually all he had to do was ring the bell and the dog would salivate. He had learned a reflex. Right? He'd acquired a reflex. So they can be innate or they can be learned. Reflexes can be inhibitory or excitatory, and there the key is obviously the effect it has on the effector. Does it increase the activity? All right, like Pavlov ringing that bell, they salivate more, so it can increase the activity or it can decrease the activity relaxing the muscle, dilating the pupil, doing something along those lines. I think all of those are pretty intuitive, but these last two are where things get a little bit tricky from a vocabulary standpoint. Let's start at least with the easier one, contralateral versus ipsilateral. What does it mean to be ipsilateral again? Same side. So if I touch my right hand on something hot, and as a result of that, I pull away my right hand, that would be an example of an ipsilateral reflex. Ipsilateral is what it all happens on the same side. However, not all pain reflexes are necessarily going to be like that. If you think about it, I'm walking down the street, and as I'm walking down the street, I step on something hot or something sharp. Do I just pull my leg away without making any other changes to my body? If I just pulled my leg away, I would fall to the ground. So notice if you step on something painful, not only do you pull away with one side of the body, but your other side of the body has to extend so that you can maintain your balance. In that case, information has to cross the midline. And that would be an example of where the reflex controls both sides. So hopefully I think that one makes sense because those are terms we've talked about before. So let's talk about what it means to be, and I guess that for this I'm gonna cheat and we'll come to the whiteboard real quickly. What do you think it means to be monosynaptic? Mono means, oops, I said oops, I spell it right. One, one synapse. That's what monosynaptic means, one synapse. If I have one synapse, how many neurons? How many neurons do I need for one synapse? Excellent, two neurons, perfect. So notice, and we'll do our simple drawings. Here is a neuron. Here is its axon. Here is its synaptic end bulb where it stimulates our second neuron. That of course, as a cell body has an axon, right? So notice here, we just have one synapse between two neurons. A monosynaptic reflex is our most simplest reflex. All it takes is two neurons to make it. And because those two neurons have one synapse, and again, synapses are where we make our decisions. 
and that allows things to be really, really basic, right? Which is a good thing. So therefore, if we have a polysynaptic reflex, then that means it has to be two or more reflexes, uh, pardon me, two or more synapses. And if we have two or more synapses, we need three or more neurons. So we can have neuron one, neuron two, neuron three, one synapse, two synapses, and et cetera. Obviously it can be more than that as well. But notice with this, we have at least two synapses and to have at least two synapses, we have to have at least three neurons. So how many neurons are involved in the process, how many synapses where we make decisions are involved is basically uh, our uh, definition for these reflexes. All right. So notice there are lots of ways we can talk about reflexes. For this exam, we are going to be responsible for, oops, I lost my annotation. There we go. You're only going to be responsible for spinal reflexes. And for those spinal reflexes, you are only going to be responsible for two specific types. All right. So actually, let's go back. Spinal reflexes, you need to know the general anatomy of a spinal reflex. And then there are going to be two specific types of spinal reflexes that you will need to be able to understand and describe and know why they're important as well. All right. Questions on that? All right. Let's talk first about the general anatomy of a reflex. There are five components of a reflex. Now remember, we're talking about spinal reflexes, so we can cheat a little bit, and we know that this is going to need to involve the spinal cord. And if you think about it, even though we weren't really calling them reflexes, uh, as we know, reflexes help us to maintain homeostasis, and we know what's necessary to maintain homeostasis, right? The first thing is there is a disturbance. Um, so, no, it would be a cranial reflex, because if you think about it, the hearing coming in is auditory, and auditory uh, well, actually, no, auditory does go through the spinal cord. So yes, that would be spinal. No, hearing goes through the cranial, so it would be cranial. Cranial coming in, motor going out. Somatic motor going out. So that would actually be a cranial reflex. Hearing is cranial. All right. First, there is a disturbance. And obviously, if there is a disturbance, we need some type of receptor that is able to perceive Uh, the stimulus, right? That there is some type of change taking place. We need some type of receptor. So that is the first component that is necessary of a reflex. Next, we need to get that to the spinal cord so that it can be processed. For that, we need our sensory pathway, right? Which again, as we know, is afferent. And that is going to carry the information into the spinal cord where it's going to be processed. That is our third component. As we know, in the gray matter of our spinal cord, we integrate right, the information. We process the information. We make a decision. Uh, 
on the information. All right? If you think about it, oops. this is what before we were calling the command center, the gray matter where all of this was going to take place. And of course, where we make decisions are going to be the synapses. This is where our decisions are taking place at one or more synapses uh, that is located here. Once we make that decision, we have to send the information out. We need that efferent pathway, or oops, I don't know why that's there. Let's do E consistent. Our motor pathway, which is efferent, and again, carries the information out of the central nervous system. Well, of course, even though I didn't write it here, this carries info into the central nervous system. And when that information is carried out, it goes to the specific effector. Now, Again, these can be any of the possible effectors, but since we are focusing, well, so let's say, what are the things that can be effectors again? Glands. What else? Smooth muscle. Cardiac muscle. And skeletal muscle. Excellent. Those are the things that can be effectors. However, I will point out that you are going to be responsible specifically for somatic spinal reflexes. And so as a result of that, what specific effector will you be responsible for? Well, if it's a somatic spinal reflex, it's the effector is skeletal muscle. Excellent. So for both of your examples, the effector will actually be skeletal muscle. But these are the five components. Oh, I didn't put a five here in front of the effector. So let's cheat and sneak that in. Five. There you go. Those are the five components that are necessary for a reflex. And if you think about it, that really isn't any different from what we've been talking about at the very beginning of this class when we talked about homeostasis. Because after all, that's what reflexes are about. Reflexes are about maintaining homeostasis. All right. Questions on that? All right, with that in our pocket, and again, here we can see those receptor, sensory neuron, our integration center where we're processing the information with those synapses that are taking place, making our decision, motor neuron out, and the effector. All right, there are two important somatic spinal reflexes we're gonna be responsible for, the stretch and the flexor reflex, uh, which is also known as the withdrawal reflex. Let's take a look at the pretty picture for the stretch reflex first. And the stretch reflex is actually the reflex that we were talking about when the doctor hits you on the knee with the hammer. Notice closely as we look here, he's not actually hitting you on the knee. What he is trying to do is actually hit you right on that patellar ligament. And when he hits you on that patellar ligament, it causes your knee to kick out. The reason for this and the function of this uh, reflex is to maintain our balance, right? To maintain our posture. I've said it many times, but this ability to stand here without swaying back and forth is something we take for granted. And it is a really tricky, challenging process. The way we're able to do it is inside of our muscles, 
there is a special receptor and that special receptor is called a muscle spindle. The job of the muscle spindle is to tell you how much the muscle is stretched out. Or a simpler way to put this is it tells you the length of the muscle. So let's think of the example again of me standing here trying to maintain my balance. If I started to lean to the side, notice my muscles over here would start to elongate. They would start to stretch out. And so what that would tell me is, hey, you're starting to fall to the left. So these muscles would then want to contract to bring me back into balance. Of course, if they contracted too much, then I'd start to lean this way and these muscles would get longer. And so they would contract and they would bring me back. And in that fashion, I'm making tiny changes to the length of this muscle to maintain my balance. And it's the same thing here in the leg. If I were to start to lean back, my quadricep muscles would get longer and as they stretched, they would then contract to bring me forward. And that's what the doctor's doing. When he hits that patellar ligament with that hammer, when he hits that patellar ligament on the hammer, what that causes is a rapid tug of the muscles. And it tricks that muscle spindle into thinking, holy crap, I'm getting really long really fast. And if that muscle's getting really long really fast, what it needs to do is contract really quickly to bring us back into balance. And that's what happens. That tug on the muscle tricks the muscle into contracting to try to get shorter, and that's what swings your leg out. So this is an important uh, reflex for maintaining posture, for maintaining balance. Notice we need those five components. And again, obviously you're not gonna be drawing this on the exam. There's no way, to, I mean, I guess we have the whiteboard, but I don't, you're not, I'm not gonna have you draw something on that whiteboard. You're gonna be describing this with words, but I do think seeing it visually helps us to understand that. Uh, so I'll show it here, but then we'll write it out on the whiteboard in just a second. Uh, but notice part one, we have our stimulus and that is that rapid stretch of the muscle. We then have our receptor, that muscle spindle that is receiving that sensory bit of information, that tug of the muscle. And notice the receptor is in a muscle, and let's pick a muscle here, the rectus uh, femoris. So it's inside the rectus femoris. that is then carried by a sensory neuron into the spinal cord. However, as we know, because we have talked about it now, if I give you a piece of information like that a neuron is sensory in its function, do we know what its structural classification is? What would the structural classification of a sensory neuron be? Yeah, sure, you can always cheat and look at the picture. What is the structural classification of sensory neurons? Unipolar, excellent. It is unipolar, absolutely. And we know the location of where its cell body is going to be. Where's the location of its cell body going to be? Dorsal root ganglion, excellent. So not only can we say there is a sensory neuron, but we can describe its characteristics. Its cell body is located in the dorsal root ganglion. It is a unipolar neuron that brings its information in. And notice its axon travels all the way to the anterior gray horn. In the anterior gray horn, 
we have a neuron. What is the structural classification of the neuron located in the anterior gray horn? Structurally, it's multipolar. And what is the functional classification of the neuron in the anterior gray horn? It is motor and you get partial credit for motor. What do you need to say if you want full credit? Somatic motor, excellent. Here we have a somatic motor neuron, multipolar neuron in the anterior gray horn. Its axon leaves and it goes to our effector. And notice in this case, the effector is the same muscle that was stimulated. It was the rectus femoris that was stretched out. So it is the rectus femoris that is going to contract. Notice there are only two neurons in this pathway. There is only one synapse in this pathway. So this is a somatic ipsilateral monosynaptic reflex. All right. So you need to be able to describe the reflex. You need to know why it's important. You need to be able to describe the five components. What is the receptor? What is the sensory pathway? Where are the synapses? What happens at that synapse, right? Obviously this is excitatory, where it stimulates the muscle to fire an action potential. All righty, questions on that? All right, so that is our stretch reflex. Let's then talk about, and we'll get to that in a second. Oh, sorry, that's what I wanted. Ugh. Our flexor reflex. The flexor reflex is also a withdrawal reflex. Remember way back when we were talking about the actions of muscles, we said that flexing is a protective action. Remember we mentioned if you flexed everything together, you'd curl up in the fetal position because flexing is a, a protective activity. And that's what happens. You touch something painful and you're going to pull your hand away from it. I know we have a great picture of this here, but I wanna show you, I wanna draw this out because I wanna actually make a little bit more sense of this. So let's come here and erase this. Because here we have different effectors. So up here, oh no, hold on, let's do this in black. Black and thin, too thin. All right. Two, three, four, five, there's your thumb. There you go, there is the perfect example of what a hand looks like. And rather than a hot pan, let's say we touch a tack. All right, so that is our stimulus. We are getting a painful stimulus to our thumb. However, to be able to pull away, obviously we need to be able to stimulate some type of flexor muscle. to draw our arm away. The problem is that we also have extensor muscles as well. Now, if I reach out, I am using my tricep brachia to reach out by extending my elbow. If at the same time I contract my tricep brachia, I also contract my bicep brachia. If I 
contract both of those muscles at the same time, where does my arm go? Is my arm gonna move if both my bicep brachia and my tricep brachia are both contracting at the same time? No. So notice if my goal is to move away from something painful, I need to stimulate, or let's be more specific, I need to excite my flexor so that it fires action potentials and it contracts. But at the same time, my goal here is to inhibit the extensor so that there's no action potentials so that the muscle relaxes. Right? This is the problem when you grab onto that electrified fence. When you grab onto that electrified fence, the electrical stimulus goes up your entire arm, stimulating all the muscles at the same time, and you're locked in that position and you have trouble letting go because all the muscles are contracting at the same time. We don't want that. If we want to be able to move away, we need to both be able to um, excite one muscle to contract it and relax the other. So notice right off the bat, we have two effectors with this particular pathway, and we also have a different stimulus. Remember before, the stimulus was in the rectus or, or receptor, let's say different receptor. Remember with the stretch reflex, the receptor was in the muscle we were gonna move. Here, the receptor's in my thumb, but the muscles that I'm moving are in my arm. All right, now obviously the last part of this is we need our spinal cord, because obviously that is where our processing is gonna take place. And just for the heck of it, I will draw our little butterfly here, posterior, lateral, anterior, gray horn, anterior gray horn, lateral gray horn. There you go. We need our dorsal root with our dorsal root ganglion, and we need our ventral root that we know come together to form our spinal nerve. Excellent. So here is the basic anatomy. And again, a little simpler than what we saw in the picture before, so I think this will be useful. But let's go through it, because we still have all of the same things. Obviously, the first thing we need is a stimulus and a receptor. So our stimulus here is pain. And anyone remember what the name of the specific sensory structure in our skin that allows us to perceive pain is? If only we had learned the sensory receptors of the skin. We might be able to remember what it was in the skin that allowed us to perceive things like temperature uh, and pain and tickle and itch. It wasn't a big elaborate structure like the Pisidian corpuscle or the Merkel disc or anything like that. There you go, it was a free nerve ending. Excellent, so out here in our thumb, we have a free nerve ending that receives that information. And that free nerve ending that receives that information is then going to send that information to the spinal cord, right? Afferently. Via a sensory, whoops, neuron, whoops. And we know three things about this neuron. We know it is sensory. So what is its structural classification? Polar. And what is the location of its cell body?
dorsal root ganglion. Perfect, excellent. So let's draw that. I have a neuron whose cell body is located here in the dorsal root ganglion. Its axon receives the information from the free nerve ending. Oops, hold on. That's... Well, actually, no, I like that. We'll do that. Right down the center, come this way, and up like this and into the spinal cord. All right. Excellent. So that's two. That's our effector. Two effectors. Pardon me. That's and then that's number two. Our sensory afferent pathway. Now let's not work about the spinal cord for a second. Let's jump ahead to our fourth component, the motor information out. Right, the efferent pathway. However, we have two effectors. So how many efferent pathways are we going to need? Sound trick question. Two different effectors, so we need two different pathways. Pathways, plural. All right, one to the flexor. And one, two, the extensor. Excellent. These are still both motor pathways, though. So with a motor pathway, since and more specifically somatic motor, because we're going to skeletal muscle, what is the structural classification of a somatic motor neuron? Multipolar. And where is its cell body located? Actually, I'm going to cheat and move this stuff over here. Anterior gray horn. Excellent. Perfect. So, what I will do is I will use two different colors of blue. I will use light blue. Uh, for the one going to the flexor. So here we have, whoops, no, that's not blue. Blue. All right, so here is my multipolar neuron. Put a couple dendrites on it so we remember. And it is going out our ventral root to our flexor. And there's my synaptic bulb. And then I will also draw a second one in the darker blue, also multipolar, also located in the anterior gray horn. And this one also comes out the ventral root, but this one is going to go to my extensor. Excellent. So we have our two effectors, right? That really is part five, if you think about it, our fourth pathway. Two, there are two extensors. So let's actually make this simpler. Erase that. So we'll use purple for this. Part five is the effectors. There are two of them. One flexor and one extensor. Excellent. So I'll sneak that down here. No, I'll leave it back over to us. That's convenient. All right. We've done the easy parts of this. So now what we need to talk about, the last component of this is going to be, and for this I'll start with pink. Oh, no, actually, hold on. Uh, well, okay. I'll leave that for pink for that. So then that will allow me to use, I don't even remember what color I was using before. What was that there for? Uh, purple, we'll use purple. For our integration, part three is integration. Now, in this case, we have a polysynaptic reflex. Remember the previous one was um, monosynaptic, 
So it just, the sensory neuron connected right to the motor neuron, and there was only one synapse. In this case, though, what's going to happen is we already have three neurons, but there's going to be a total of actually four neurons. And with those four neurons, we are going to have one, two, three synapses. I think that's right. One, two, three. Yeah, three synapses with four neurons. All right. So, synapse one. Synapse one are sensory neuron actually synapses on the motor or the flexor motor, let's say it this way, motor neuron. Kind of like what we saw in our monosynaptic. So this is going to come down, synapse here, and when it synapses here, it is excitatory. And if you think about it, if this is going to be excitatory, then that is gonna cause this to fire action potentials, and it is going to contract. Great, we have accomplished our goal. We have at least half of our goal. We've gotten our flexor muscle to contract. But we also have to get the extensor to relax at the same time. And to do that, our second synapse is between our sensory neuron and an interneuron. Now, I have an interneuron. What is the structural classification of my interneurons? Structural classification of interneurons, multipolar. And in this case, it's gotta be in the central nervous system. Its location is in the central nervous system because that's where all our interneurons are located. But in this case, it's in the uh, posterior gray, oops, gray, oops, still not gray, gray horn. So what happens is, uh, so I need to draw this neuron comes over and synapses on an interneuron that is multipolar. And this interneuron actually does a bunch of things, but one of the most important things it does right now is it synapses on our extensor motor neuron. Now, this synapse here is also excitatory. And so since it's excitatory, our interneuron fires action potentials. But what's interesting is that our interneuron inhibits the extensor neuron. So since it inhibits the extensor neuron, here we get no action potentials, and with no action potentials, our extensor relaxes. And that is our third synapse. Our third synapse is that synapse between the interneuron and our extensor motor neuron that causes it to relax. Now again, I've made a little bit of a mess of this picture, but now that I've walked you through it, I think if we go back and look at this picture, we can see where hopefully that makes some sense. So again, notice if we follow the pathway in, we have our pain stimulus from that free, uh, from that free nerve ending, a unipolar sensory neuron carries that information into the spinal cord, where, oops, this model is wrong where one of the nerves comes and synapses here directly 
onto our motor neuron, causing our flexor to relax. The second one connects to an interneuron, which inhibits this one so that it relaxes. Now notice it also is the one that goes up to the brain to tell us that we're in pain as well. I don't think I ever realized that this was wrong. So let's go back to my picture. I like my picture better because obviously that's what I want you to know for the exam. So one inner neuron, and that inner neuron basically switches the signal. So we get excitation here, but we get inhibition here. So one muscle contracts and the other muscle relaxes. All right. And of course, why is this reflex important? Why is the withdrawal reflex important? Is it like a defense mechanism? Yeah, it protects the body. It protects you from a painful stimulus, pulls you away from something damaging or dangerous. All right. So there you go. Those are your two reflexes you're responsible for. Obviously, you need to know the generic components, these two specific components, why reflexes are important. And that is everything you needed to know for the spinal cord. All right. On Monday, we start the autonomic nervous system. Here is the problem with the way this class sets up. The autonomic nervous system is the very last thing we talk about, but as you move from 430 to 431, it's some of the most important stuff. Of all the things that you're learning in this class, the stuff that you're probably going to use the most in 431 is the stuff on the autonomic nervous system. Because when you talk about the digestive system, what controls the digestive system? The autonomic nervous system. When you talk about respiration, guess what controls the respiration system? Autonomic nervous system. When you talk about the cardiovascular system, it's controlled by the autonomic nervous system. It's at the end because it's the great lead in to 431, and it's the information you're going to use the most in 431. The problem is it's at the end of the class, and everybody's exhausted at this period of time. So I know you're tired. I know you're exhausted. I know this has been a brutal session, but we are coming up on some of these last two lectures are really important, not for just for this section, but you're going to use all this information going forward into 431. So it's time to rally the troops. One last big push. One week from today, you're done. At this time, one week from today, you should be done and already three drinks into whatever your favorite beverage of choice is. All right. But for this last week, we got to hit it hard. We got a lot to material to cover, and this material is going to be really, really important. So I strongly encourage you, with this being your last study weekend, to start looking ahead. Read the lecture notes. Use the lecture notes as a guide to work you through the textbook. Take a look at some of this material first. Otherwise, it can be a little overwhelming when we start next week. All right. Questions on any of that? All right, excellent. In that case, that is all I have for you. Uh, enjoy the re uh, your weekend, study hard, be safe, be healthy, make good choices, wear your mask, enjoy baseball. I think that's everything. All right, take care everybody.